Welcome back to the Bourbon VS podcast, everyone. This is episode 311. And Nate just cracked a bottle there. Nice cork pop there. That was. I had some thud to it. Yeah, some bass. Mm, kind of like your voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good water. <laughs> uh, it's just Nate and I this week. No guests, so we are relying on all of you to uh, keep this conversation going with us. I want to thank our sponsors here. Um, first and foremost, you guys. And that's going to be uh, at patreon.com slash bourbon and BS podcast. Uh, that's going to be you guys. We can do a $5, $10, $25 dollar tier. We appreciate the continued support. We also have the option through Venmo at bourbon and BS. We're not just, uh, you know, asking for money, but it does help keep the show going. So we appreciate that. And I uh, also want to thank um, our sponsors, Tinderbox at Easton. In Columbus, Ohio, that's where we're getting this featured cigar tonight. It is the Oliva Siri V Maduro. And you can find that at the uh, Tinderbox at Easton in Columbus, Ohio, along with a lot of other Oliva brand cigars, along with the Nub Collection as well. Also want to thank Altidus USA. We've got some, one of Nate's favorite cigars. I grabbed it while we have the opportunity to do that. Leftover, in a sense, from the 10 event. So, uh. We've got a great stock of the Monte Cristo 1935 anniversary, and this is going to be the number two, not only number two size, but the number two, according to Cigar Aficionado, in 2021? 20... Yes. Nice. Says it right on the band. I wasn't looking at it. I couldn't read it. <laughs> I was trying to reach in the back of my memory. So, Altus USA, thank you. Got the Monte Cristo behind us, Romeo Julieta, the H. Upman and AG Room logos there on the table and behind us. But they've got a great portfolio. Uh, check them out, and we appreciate the continued support. And also the BS Cigar Company, available at Tinderbox at Easton, along with a handful of other shops. But you guys can get them mailed to you if, if you'd like. The gold and silver. Golden is made by Placencia, and the silver is made by Espinosa Cigars. So check them out. Fantastic cigars. That was some of my favorites. But I might be a little bit biased. So there you go. Also want to, um, I, we both have some of the gear on tonight, uh, by jack.com. You're double dipping here. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got the BS cigar three quarter sleeves. Nate's got the pour one more light up another. We'll figure this out together. Podcast t-shirt underneath the fancy barrel head logo, black camo hoodie. So, uh, yeah, we look good. If you listen on the audio, we look good. We sound good too. We should. <laughs> Let's hope so. Um, we are, let's start with the whiskey. Yeah? Yeah. So this is uh, Pure Kentucky XO. So, I just put Pure Kentucky on the screen. So. That's fine. All right. Uh, XO in spirits, you know, whether it be uh, bourbon or cognac. Cognac's where you usually see XO a lot more, uh, but just stands for extra old. That's it uh is there a classification do we know different spirits have different classifications okay. for this one uh particularly this is at least 12 years oh shit yeah <laughs> yeah so yes. you yeah. almost drive a car <laughs> yeah so this is a this is a uh 12 year uh bourbon coming out of willet which a lot of people don't realize that because it the only place you see it is kind of on the sides of the bottle and the back of the bottle um it's not on the label. It just kind of has, you know, that state of Kentucky with a brown background and a blue border because it's the bluegrass state. Um, it is. And it comes in at 107 proof. Even, huh? Yep. Oh, wait. <laughs> not the proof. No, the flavor? Yeah. There's – go ahead. Because that first sip I had before we actually, sh you know, showed ourselves on camera. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's something there. There's the finish is what I'm stuck on at the moment because I took the one sip. But <laughs> um, it's like chocolate. At the very end. I And it just lingers. I get this like uh, a candied chocolate. I know it sounds stupid, no, but like, I, I, like I, um, uh, what was it? Easter? If you've ever had like the uh, 
the the chocolate eggs, like the the Hershey chocolate like little guys. Oh, okay. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I was going with more like uh chocolate and orange. I get I get a, like an orange citrus to it. So a little so, sweetness, like yeah. I'm saying, you know but what I mean? Candy. Like I was almost thinking kind of like those uh the chocolates that you get. I think it's at Christmas time where it's a chocolate orange that you break up and it's wedges. Yeah. But yeah, that on the finish, but it's <clears throat> and it's got wow. There's a little bit of spice to it, but there's also some nice butterscotch notes to this up front. Yeah, it's you know there are several there are several products out there that come in at this 107 proof, and this drink is smoother than most of them, I'd say. Yeah, it doesn't really drink that high. Mm. It's yeah, it's it's. I mean, there's some citrus. There's a little cinnamon. A little bit, a little, yeah. A little spice. But then, yeah, that finish, it's its like a milk chocolate. That's bizarre, Because it doesn't have this bitterness. Like That is chocolate. bizarre. <laughs> it is. I mean, oh, not I, a bad thing. It's I just... told you the best part, but go ahead. Oh. Is it flavored? No, it's not no, I'm flavored. I'm just kidding. I've had this a long time ago. <laughs> well, and it used to be uh, a different bottle. The neck wasn't as long and thin. Yeah. It used to be a, a little stubbier bottle. Yeah. Yeah. This what's the best part? This actually just recently came into Ohio right. on a regular basis uh in March. So this is now something that liquor agencies can order. Um you can go in. We we just have it sitting right on the shelf. Uh I don't even think we're limiting it anymore. I know the first week we got it at Carpanias, we were doing one per person. Um this and a couple other Willet products called Old Bart's Town. Some of your favorites. Uh, yeah, you and I had an old Bardstown bottled and bond uh, that we had picked up when you and I were in Louisville back in 21. Yeah. Oh, when I, I'm thinking very old Barton. That was a great one, too. Yeah, yes. that's what I was thinking yeah. of, but old Bardstown is good as well, yes. Yep, and, and that's yes. that's a Willow product. The ones, the old Bardstowns that are now available in Ohio are the 90 and 101 proof. Uh, but now Pure Kentucky is available in Ohio as well. Terry's chocolate orange. That, I think that's the. I know. Is that what it's called? I guess. Who's Terry? <laughs> <laughs> Terry Cruz. Uh, That'd be cool. Yeah. Um. Wow. Yeah. James Allen Young loves those. So this is available in Ohio. This this was yeah. something that was. Now you're going back five plus years ago, but it was something that I thought was still kind of tough to find, even like it, for our region. If you went over the border of Kentucky to like party source, it was still kind of a lot of Willow products were. Oh, yeah. You either had them or you didn't. You know, it was like that day. It was kind yeah. of like Buffalo Trace products even yep. back then. Um, so, yeah, I, I had this a long time ago. It definitely, yeah, it's different. Well, and now the Willet stuff, or um, yeah, the Willet stuff is now readily available in Ohio, like at Carfania's. So we've got the two old Bards towns, we've got Pure Kentucky. We've got uh, pot still on the shelf. Uh, we got Noah's Mill, Rowan's Creek, and the family estate for your rock. Just on the shelf? Just on the shelf. I need to go up there more Just often. Sitting on the shelf. Yep. The prices have gone up. But. Yeah, on some of those, yeah. I mean, what do they're you, available. What do you think of this? What do I think of this or what do I think the it price. is? The price. I'm going to hit. 12 year, 107 for 49.95. 44.99 price is right i lost but 45 bucks no i only i only remember because i remember seeing this like at the party source and it was i don't say bottom shelf but it was like kind of oh that's a willet product and that was also when rowan rowan's creek was like 39 or whatever so this was i yeah. think like 29 like 25 20 it was like yeah, it wasn't super expensive, but it was like, oh, this is really good. And again, to not boast that it's twelve year, it's it's bizarre. <laughs> Original small batch bourbon, handmade in Kentucky, aged in new charred oak barrels, bottled in Kentucky. Does it say twelve year on here? No, anywhere. Do a little research and look it up. Doesn't make any sense. Like, why wouldn't you put it on there? It's interesting. 
So it's 45 bucks, huh? Mm-hmm. And, and what's funny is the first week we got this in the store, mm -hmm. like I had recognized it and I'm like, oh my gosh, I know what that is. I hadn't seen it in forever. And right. And so I was like, I'm definitely going to buy a bottle. And it was, we actually, the first week we got it, we actually had it behind the counter on the shelves because that's where all the bourbon hunters look when they first come in the store. Right. You've trained them well. Uh, it was behind the shelves. <laughs> that's also sometimes where we'll put stuff that we want to move. Uh, Ooh inside information <laughs> there uh but no Watch we, out people it, it came in the other all the allocated stuff was right there with it yeah. behind the counter yeah and we only got in one case which is six bottles okay we put it out on saturday and we still had bottles on tuesday of this of this wow like people just people were passing on it and we would tell you know them, why we would tell them it was a Willet product, and they're like, "No, oh, no." <laughs> Let me guess. I'm because gonna do a quick. Go ahead. Go Google ahead. Take search. Your Take your guess. There's no secondary market. I bet you. Let's see here. Pure Kentucky. Let's see how predictable people are. We literally get people that come in the store and have asked us, "Hey, you know what the secondary is on that bottle?" Nope. And, they, and then they just turn and walk away. Pure Kentucky is you can resell it for about fifty one ninety nine. <laughs> so, so after tax, you make about two bucks. Correct. Yeah. God, that's so sad. <laughs> James Allen Young says lots of people pass if it's not Sazerac. Ironically enough, the one that actually has Sazerac's name on it, people pass on Sazerac Rye. Mm -hmm. Because once again, it sits on the shelf, but no there's secondary. no secondary market. Yep. No secondary. Thirty dollar no bottle of rye. Everyone's like, yeah, it's, it's it's not very good. It's like their bottom shelf. It's good mixer. I'm like, okay. Yeah, you love drinking that. Just I mean, that's that's a daily for you. Hundred percent. Because it's just smooth and. Yeah, yeah. And 90, now that's on the shelf. Ninety five proof. It's still behind uh, at the Kroger 90, up here. Ninety, I thought. Ninety. Okay. But yeah, it, I mean, we have it sitting on the end cap next to all the Willet stuff. And yeah, that's fine. It's, it's no longer, fine. It's no longer allocated. Just, it's no longer limited. You guys can't make fucking thirty bucks or fifty bucks or hundred bucks on something. That's great because <laughs> we're gonna fucking drink it. Yeah. Yeah. Weird thought there. Yeah. Sorry, you guys can't oh, uh, use it as currency. Is that what you're supposed to do with bourbon mm -hmm. or whiskey? Drink it. Uh. I'm in. I'm. In, I'm not gonna knock part of it. You know, like I said, I appreciate. But like, come on, guys. Like, to make a secondary income off of that is whatever. It's America, but. <laughs> Jesus, just leave a couple for us to actually fucking drink. Let's try that for once. Huh? <laughs> That'd be nice. Yeah, good. Well, I'm glad this doesn't have a secondary market. Um, James says, says rye is solid. Get a bottle of Green River rye to drink next week, and you'll never look back. Though we've had that. No, not the rye. The rye just became available in Ohio. Starting what were the this two that we had that were sent to us. So you have the bourbon and weeded bourbon. Uh, that's what you're right so 70 yeah. percent corn nine percent malt barley we got that before it's even in the state yes I we did. That's why I was confused. yes we did uh thank you aaron harris um Absolutely. shout out aaron harris and um but yeah the rye supposed to drop in ohio starting this month i right. know some people have already picked it up uh we haven't gotten ours yet hopefully mm -hmm. but i mean then again so far still we still get asked a shit ton every single day for blackberry crown yeah, I mean that's just fun, I guess, for some people. Unless yeah. there's a secondary market for that. Oh, there was. There were probably. People, I mean, twenty eight dollar bottle, so it's just over thirty after tax, and uh, I think people were reselling it for like fifty because it was. I mean, people were calling every single store. What drink. was it going for? Like, what was the cost? Twenty seven ninety nine. So I'm making twenty bucks off. I mean, that's a good markup. <laughs> that's a real good markup actually <laughs> but still and 20 bucks is 20 bucks so yeah jesus people i i was fortunate enough because the last time we had it at the store um we had two bottles left and uh todd from the shop wanted one because todd doesn't drink like 90 proof buffalo trace is it's hot is hot for todd like that's good like when it's i hot toddy when I bring <laughs> when I bring stuff in for myself and Dan or you to try, yeah, like 
I gotta be careful what I what I pour Todd because I poured him some rum one time and it damn near killed him. Uh, Wrecked him. Yeah, but then you know, I poured some stuff that's been over a hundred. He's been fine with, but he actually got very interested in that blackberry crown, and yeah. um, I was like, "Well, if we have any left, I'll get you a bottle." And sure enough, I go in the store. We we had two left. I got one, and a couple hours later, he actually showed up in the store. I was like, "Hey, I got something for you." <laughs> nice. And he'll have that bottle for five years. Uh, no, he won't. Oh, really? He no. likes it? Oh, yeah, he does, because he mixes it with uh, uh, Mike's Hard Lemonade. What? Because that Blackberry, or Sprite. He mixes it with Sprite. I was going to say, dude, like, come on. That's a heavy drink for him. <laughs> well, yeah, it's only 80 proof to start out with. Add like Mike's Hard Lemonade. It's not going to up it that much. With the sugar, it might, though, within well, that. There is that. Oh, because Sprite's so much better. <laughs> Adding alcohol. <laughs> we used to do a drink called Johnny Jump Up, and you'd drop a shot of Jameson into a pint of Strongbow cider. Mm. Pint? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right in there. Two of those, three of those, fucked up. <laughs> Gone. You? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's saying something, sadly. <laughs> like that I'm a benchmark for that. But yes, I yeah, that three Jesus. shots of Jameson and three ciders. That's All it. Right. All right. I'm telling you. Sinker and drinker. <laughs> so it's when you mix that shit and then the sugar and the everything. Yeah, man. It's oh yeah. Yeah, you're well, that's why that's why when I drink rums now, I try and find you know some, some really clean rums and not ones that have a bunch of added sugars in it. Yeah. Because I did that one time where I drank half a bottle in a night and I it's the only time in my life I've ever had a hangover. I felt like, in Dominican Republic. No, I was in Chicago. No, I said and in Dominican Republic. No, I didn't have a hangover. Jesus, I drank an entire bottle of scotch at night. Nope, I didn't have a hangover. Should have. <laughs> Hard cider and fireball. I'll stick with the Jameson. Yeah, <laughs> no, thank you, Aaron. It's that cinnamon no. apple he's going for. I know, but no, no, thank you. But like, you know, again, that's Buffalo Trace product, so maybe I see what he's going with. I had someone come in in the other day asking for. Apparently, there's a new Fireball that's actually aged in bourbon barrels. Aren't they all? I don't, I don't know that it is. Fireball is a Buffalo Trace product. It is. It is. I think they would, but who knows? Ray says almost as bad as snorting tequila. I don't know what parties you've been at when you lived in Mexico, Ray, but uh, <laughs> oof. <laughs> Sounds like something you do in Tijuana. <laughs> ah, the worm. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Have one of those, Nate. Oh, boy. Um, yeah. The drink is good. I um, Very flavorful. Mm -hmm. Very flavorful. Well, and when I got this... Like I was sitting there thinking to compare it to something. Like what else do I know of that's out there that's 107 proof? Well, antique. Yep, Weller Antique. Yeah, people go nuts for that, and that's a weeded bourbon that drinks hotter. Yeah, and which is crazy because it's weeded. Most weeders drink a little softer on the palate, or maybe a little bit of a sweetness because they don't have that rye in the mash bill that provides that spice and that floral note. Yeah. And yet, like that one, that Weller Antique 107, same exact proof, but man, that's just a lot of heat, a lot of spice on the palate. This, no, you got a lot of sweetness, you got a lot of floral notes, citrus notes, that chocolate on the finish. I mean, it's got a little bit of like the, um, it's, it's, I don't want, it's like in between milk chocolate and dark chocolate. So that, was that semi sweet? Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm getting. So it's not like real creamy, creamy chocolate, um, and it's not bitter, but it's like on the the border there. Okay. For me, it's it's um, it's a lot of flavor. Baker's is one of seven, also James. Oh yeah, ba yeah. yeah. Baker Seven, which is always at least a seven year, always single barrel, and then always one hundred and seven proof. So I we've had some of those that have been seven years, some of those have been. Eight nine years, it yeah. all depends on you know what they're putting out that time, but yeah, um, that's another one. This this has a completely different flavor profile, and I think I think this one uh drinks lighter and a little sweeter than Baker Seven, yeah, and lower price point, 
Again, forty four ninety five. You say yeah, this is a forty five dollar bottle. Uh, we all know Weller Antique is fifty six, and then Baker's. I th- I think Baker's is sixty. Okay. But Baker's is com- Baker's is uh one of the Jim Beam brands. So you got Jim Beam, Basil Hayden, and those. So Baker's, Booker's, those are all under that same brand. Sorry, I'm getting some further information on the cigar here. I'm clarifying something before we talk about it. Ah. Um, yeah, it doesn't drink hot, but I, I will say some of the proof, I think, with the 107, it, it gives it a little bit, like it pronounces the flavors without sometimes having that extra heat it's just they're like rich like they're in your face well and, and one of the things i i think because it, it almost reminds me of when we uh at the store we had that uh, uh that happy flight at the bar you know you have those different ages and then different proof wow. points sometimes when you go a lot of years in a barrel and then go low proof like our bottle from last week yeah. You end up getting just a lot of oak on the palate. Yeah. This one, by up in the proof, you get, I, I, I think you get a lot more flavor out of it that kind of hides that oakiness. Like, you know, as much as we've drank this so far tonight, it's like at no point did either one of us sit there and look at each other and go, yeah, I get a lot of oak on this. No, no. And it's the same age as what we drank last year, last week, which was a yeah. 90 proof bottle. And two dollars cheaper. This is not weeded, right? No, this is no, no, this is uh corn, rye, and malted barley. And you're in that 70 to 75 percent corn in there, yeah. And then, uh, I think you're around, I think you're around a 10 percent barley on it, okay, somewhere around there. Yeah, it's good. Um, I'm 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 still on the fence. And this cigar that we're we're smoking um is I think a pretty stout cigar as mm-hmm. far as flavor profile and, and strength. This is not a knock your socks off full full cigar, but it is in the realm of the uh, original Oliva V. Um that's what I was trying to get clarification because I I can't recall um texting Lee Whitaker. Um if it's the same filler and binder, it's Nicaraguan filler and binder. I thought, I, and again, I could be Go wrong. Ahead. Probably while you're asking Lee, I thought really the the V and the V Maduro they're the exact same thing except the wrapper. That's what I thought, but I wanted to try to get uh, you know. And he did say yes, but I mean, he sent me basically the snapshot of off the internet. So I mean, uh, off their own website. So I, I mean, appreciate you know. I know it's after hours messaging him, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So you got the Nicaraguan filler and binder. Um, but it's the San Andreas wrapper on this. And I think when this first came out, if I'm not mistaken, the first year they did a Maduro was a broadleaf and they switched it to the San Andreas Mexican, uh, uh, wrapper on there. But it's, um, this was originally a limited release cigar. Uh, I can't recall exactly the first time it came out, but it was 2010 ish, some around there. I know in like 13, it was a double Robusto. They changed the sizes every year. Oh, this this didn't used to come out like every year it came out in one size. Correct. And then it wasn't until recently that Correct. now they started doing multiple sizes and more readily available. Every year, yeah. That's the Olivas. And it's, it's deceiving sometimes when you see this, if you don't look at the box or you study the... So what they did was is that, I mean, it is a darker, it's a slightly darker wrap relief um but they used the same band yes so these were coming in um 10 count boxes mm-hmm. which is a big difference because the oliva Serie v the original comes in a 24 count box for okay. most of the sizes i think it's 30 for the lancero but overall it's, it's 24 yeah. um in that and they are more of a like a old like a square box. slide top yeah, rectangular but taller. Six 24. across, four deep. Correct. So this comes in a, a skinnier, uh, uh, more uh, less depth on the box, a little wider, 10 count across, and it's same brown gold on there. 
Um, but the band on it is also from looking straight at it, so <laughs> looking straight at that. It's Oliva, uh, Siri V, same band, same color scheme, exactly. The only difference is, is that the original Oliva V on the left of the logo says uh, um, Liga, Liga Especial yeah. on the right. This says Maduro Especial on it. And that is the only real indicator on this cigar that, that as far as the branding outside of the box, that this is going to be a different blend. So once you light it up and smoke it, you can tell there's a big difference. Oh, yeah. um, and it was interesting because every year they came out with, I think it was like 6,000 boxes or something to 10. And you had, it was that double Robusto. The next year it was like a Toro. The next year it was a double Toro. Then they repeated a couple of them. And uh, I remember we would bring some in and people would seek out that particular size that they really enjoyed. Um, and then Oliva came out with the four sizes and forgive me if I'm wrong, double Robusto, Toro, double Toro, and damn, I want to say Torpedo, but I think that's wrong. No, I think, I think you're right. Let's find out here. Cause I remember having this in a Torpedo. No, I think you're right. We've got, yes, Torpedo. We are both right there. So yeah, six by 54 Torpedo, 650 Toro is what we're smoking. And honestly, this size, you didn't see as much. Double Robusto got a lot of attention. Double Toro, I think they came out with two or three years in a row. Well, I mean, Double Robusto, that's their, like, I mean, it's a, what, a 5x54? It is. I mean, nowadays, I mean, old days, r traditional Robusto was a 5x50. I think a lot of brands have now done 5x52, 54. I think some even do 56 mm -hmm. as their Robusto size. But I mean, almost calling it double robusto is almost kind of yeah. And then Toro six by I mean, because five fifty is the robusto size typically, so I think that's yep. why they did that. Because they went double Toro, and, which Excuse is the most me. popular, one of the most popular sizes in of the US. Week. That double that double Toro six by sixty. That's one of the most popular sizes just across the board. Right, but in the I know the Oliva V is very popular size oh, as yeah. well. That was a tough one to get when they had. But I think that's production. one of the reasons why, like, to I think point, so, yeah. why they did that a couple yeah. times in a row. No, I would agree with that. Yeah, I'd agree with that completely. I, just, they can charge more money for it. Yeah, <laughs> but this is a very hearty looking wrapper. Mm -hmm. Um, and this this cigar actually is also featured in that. Uh, that eight pack sampler that they do at events. Oh yeah. So it's a surprising thing. Cause that's, they sell it. It's, it, they don't really have a description. It just says eight cigars on the back and it says mm -hmm. Oliva, but you open it up and it's got like a, a, a O, a G. And then it just has a sprinkle of um, the V, the V Maduro, the master blends. Uh, they have a Churchill, Connecticut. And I mean, it's like a nice wide range of cigars. Oh yeah. But when you throw in some of the limited stuff and like the the higher end stuff from the master blends, yeah. it's just such a great value on that that, that pack. But I, I think the master blend might be my favorite thing from Oliva. Mm -hmm. But this is pretty. I mean, this is damn tasty too. I like the V, um, but this one with that Maduro wrapper to me comes across a little bit more balanced. Yeah. Um, it doesn't hit as strong as regular v's have in the past to me um but this kind of like when you you know when we first had the first pour of the whiskey there's a chocolatiness to this wrapper and but look at the flavor but not a but not to look to the flavor to the flavor, okay. the flavor. Okay. um it, but it's not because we've we've had a few san andreas products on here recently san andreas maduros yeah and this one actually smokes smoother than what a lot of those other ones have. I I feel from what I remember, some of those more recent ones, the last few months, like this one almost ha it almost gives you that broadleaf Maduro. Which again, I think the original one I forget what size it was when they first released it. It was broadleaf. But they switched it up to the San Andreas, and I, I, I don't know if it was because availability of the, because they it's use an issue. Yeah, but they use Broadleaf on their O and G Maduros. Okay. So they might have wanted to switch it up as well. So that way they're not cannibalizing their own tobacco for 
yeah. for the limited runs. Uh, Aaron Garner says that V doesn't smoke like a San Andreas to me. And again, the Maduro, I think he's he this knows, is the Maduro. He knows what he's talking about, though, I think. Well, I know. I mean, hell, I at Carfanias, I know we have some of the Milano Maduros as well. And that one, at least, it says Maduro right on the label, like front. <laughs> it's got a secondary band. Yeah. Yeah. It's got a secondary band. Uh, the boxes can be confusing. Mm -hmm. He says, got it. I don't know if that means he understands or he knew before or if it's just now he got <laughs> it. Um, talk about communication in part two. <laughs> the <laughs> fucking rears its ugly head every week. Um, yeah, this it's a rich smoke. It does have a, a little bit of a spice. It's like a more of a hint of spice for me. But I mean, I think you hit it on the head. It's kind of um, uh, you say chocolatey, mm -hmm. um, cocoa maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got the coffee, so it's got some of the classic things I find from Nicaraguan base, you know, as far as the core and a San Andreas wrapper leaf on it. But he says, "Now I got it." So now you got it. But uh, yeah, this is a great smoke. I love this size, six by fifty. I don't know. I don't. I'm not a. I'm not going down to like Corona necessarily. I do like smoking them, but like I'm not going below 50 really on my ring gauges, but I am starting to really gravitate towards like 50, 52 ring gauge. I'm even like 54. I smoked the BS Golds a lot in Toro and 54 is good. It's just, I don't know, man, I'm, I'm in this phase and it's boring to everyone else out there, but <laughs> in this phase that like, I kind of like just this size, Oh yeah. but with a six inch, you know, it's just, it, it's a long enough smoke. Sometimes you do like the Robustos that are five by fifties and you're kind of like, okay, that's a 30 minute smoke. It's not really, you know, bang for your buck. It's not where I'm at. Maybe 40 minutes, 40, whatever. But the Toro size and a 650, maybe 652. But I feel like most of the time I'm getting a 650 or I'm getting like a 654. And that's it. I, I think, I, I think a lot of companies have in between. I think a lot of companies have gone to 654 as their standard Toro size. Uh, like Espinosa does it with a lot of theirs, especially the knuckle sandwich. Like that's all the Toros. They're all that 54 ring. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the BS gold. I mean, there's, there's quite a few brands out there that I think, um, uh, have gone to that 54 ring gauge. Cause, and, and I think, and this is my opinion, uh, it's a way for them to get a little bit bigger oh ring gauge smoke than the 50 without going to the 60. Cause there are some like they leave the sixty to the six sixty and seven seventy sure. and those smokers, but Nubs, they're but... but they're trying to bridge that gap a little bit yeah. and do a fifty four or something just a little bit of a thicker smoke. But I agree, like the way that the way this smokes and you know being that thinner ring gauge. I mean, you mentioned Coronas. I like Coronas. I love Lanceros as well. They're pricey and and that, that's the other downside to them. Is sometimes. A Lancero is going to be the same cost as a, a six by 60. And so some people sit there and go, oh, there's more smoke time in the 60. I'll smoke that instead. Yeah. But there's just something about the way the flavor hits. And I we talked about it last week, too, though. We were talking about Padrones kind of on the side there where I felt like if you're, you know, it is about the amount of value you're perceiving, you're getting. But it's also about, I think, sometimes you're, you're buying the flavor. Mm-hmm. So everything goes into the cigar. It's, it's just funny because we talk about, like, for example, like a, a bottle, like a fifth of whiskey, or if you're getting a one ounce, two ounce pour, whatever it is, you can pay a lot more for a two ounce pour. You know, a bottle, at least you're getting more more drinks out of it, right? Mm -hmm. But a drink of, of a pour of whiskey at a bar, or even when you buy it yourself, you think about like that one ounce pour, let's be realistic, two ounce pour, at least for us. A two ounce pour, and you're paying twenty bucks for it. You're buying the the flavor of that because mm -hmm. you can get two ounces of a lot of other liquids, even like in whiskeys, mm -hmm. that you're going to pay less for than twenty, forty, whatever you're paying. But you're you're buying that that the overall experience of the flavor. You're not. I mean, I think that when we smoke as many cigars as we smoke, you look at it and. Am I going to pay $12 for a Corona when I can pay $13 for $14 for a Toro? Yeah. Well, and that's that's actually an issue I run into no, uh, at I mean, Carfagna's. Okay. Because when I first brought on uh, Espinosa and the Knuckle Sandwich, yeah. they were back-ordered on the Maduro um, Toro. Yeah. And so I went and – so I got the Corona Gorda, 
Uh, I hope you don't want much water because it's like my fourth leg. <laughs> so, I don't know what's going on uh, right now. So I got the Corona Gorda and it's on my shelf a buck cheaper. Just an $8 mm. cheaper than what the Toro is. And so a lot of people sit there and they look at those two cigars and like, well, why don't I just you know spend the extra buck and get a bigger smoke? And it's like, well, but if you really like the flavor of the Maduro, like someone who likes that blend, likes that flavor profile. Yeah. They'll pay that money for that. Yeah. And then you have the people that are like, ah, I want bang for buck. It's like, okay, you want, sm- I, I, I don't even say bang for buck anymore with a lot of people. I, I say smoke time for the money. There's a lot of people. I yeah. think they, fo- they focus. I think, I think there's a lot of cigar smokers out there <clears throat> that focus too much on smoke time for the money instead of flavor for the money well the, the only reason i'd say that's i mean everyone can do whatever they want but the only reason i'd say that it's, it's it's fairly expected and reasonable is because typically it's you're doing something or you're what and you doing something could be sitting <laughs> right yeah but if you have yes the flavor but you look at it as smoke time value or bang for your buck whatever you look at it you and I have also always been at that that time where you're just like, and not everyone smokes in their car. You know, you may have to go in the house, but it's like you light up a Corona, and you're you're hoping to have like an hour, hour and a half of smoking time, whatever you're doing. You get a Toro, you're you're kind of at that point, hour, hour and a half. You do a Corona, it's like I'm 45 minutes now. I got to light up another cigar. I think you smoke a little faster than I do. <laughs> If you're not working, if you're not working, yeah. I think you smoke a little faster than How that. long does the Corona last you? Well, I mean, like when you said Robusto, like 30, 45 minutes, I'm like, usually Robustos last me about an hour. Some might, I guess. Yeah. I think a five by 50, a true five by 50 can go, I think, in 40 minutes. Okay. I think. Well, because I remember, because I remember one time uh, at my original shop, we were having an Oliva event and. I was showing a customer the nubs and and nubs classic size four inches by 60 ring gauge <laughs> they have other sizes yeah they have other sizes but yeah the 460 is the most that's popular. the best seller yeah. yeah yeah by far um but i was smoke like i was talking to a customer about him like you know this cigar is still going to be like an hour and 15 hour and a half long smoke and he's like really that little thing i'm like yeah mm-hmm. it, it can and so he had bought a 460 and I was smoking, I think it was a four by 58 or four by 56, something a little bit thinner. Yeah. And I remember sitting there, I looked at my phone or I looked at my watch when I lit it up. And because we were having an event and I later on, I looked at him and I still wasn't done with the cigar. But I went back up to that customer. And I was like, look, see how much of the cigar I have left? I've been smoking for an hour and 19 minutes. Mm. The one you got was bigger than this. Mm. So it, again, different people smoke at different paces. Well, if you're talking, if you're doing something else. Yeah. But like, I, I, I didn't have to relight the cigar because no, sometimes yeah, yeah. if you get busy with yeah. other things, you know, it goes out, you have to relight, but no, I mean, just staying on it, not having to relight at all. Like, yeah. I mean, that cigar lasted me over an hour and 20 minutes as small as it was. Yeah. I think ring gauge has more to do with it than uh, the length, honestly. Mm-hmm. For sure. I just like this, and I know it sounds stupid, but it's like it, the 50 ring gauge, it's it's very... <laughs> just even like how you, you, you smoke it. Oh, yeah, it doesn't hurt. It, it like doesn't, you can kind of you know do a, this with it between yeah. your index and middle finger. And you can kind of do this whole thing. You can kind of do the other one where it's, you know, you're kind of holding it with your index finger and your thumb and your, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're doing this. It's a very versatile, <laughs> good handling on this cigar. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's a, it's a great, do they give any details about the tobacco or just say Nicaraguan? It says Nicaraguan on the uh, Oliva website. I was hoping that Lee would give me a little bit more, um, but so, again, it yeah. texted so we, at eight, eight o'clock at night or whatever. So yeah. Let me see if I can find something else here. But no, it's it's got an it's got a nice hardiness to it. I put this at like medium full. Yeah. Medium full. I would but say, yeah. Very rich. 
I, I think when I, when I smoke the V, uh, V comes across a little heavier in terms of the strength of the cigar. This one, the flavor is heavier. It's a richer smoke. Debuted in 08. Find more information here. Mm. So it's been around 16 years this year. Mm-hmm. Nice. Hmm. Yeah, I do like the cigar. It is rich. It's got a little woodiness. You know, you said not much on the whiskey, but I think a little woodiness. Mm. Yeah, how about going back and forth? <laughs> it's rich, dude. Mm-hmm. What's the what's this normally retail? So you're in that V. They, they don't really gouge. Usually what I've found with the different releases over the years, it's like a dollar more. Yeah. Like 50 cents to a dollar more than the uh, original V line of that size. Yeah. It's typically how that comes. And honestly, I think part of it could be the more limited production. But truthfully, it's 10 cigars in a box. So that box cost is split up. Not necessarily all of it, but think about that. Like just from the cost going into a product, they price it by the box. I had this conversation today with a company that was in town. Um, they have a new limited cigar and it is retails for like MSRP $30. Well, it, it comes, and for those that have been paying attention, comes in a 60 count box that's a humidor. So, yes, it's a bigger box or 60 count is big. But Oliva did it the other way. I'm thinking about this humidor box, right? So the cost of it going into that. There are Oliva that had that gold leaf recently that's like it was a $300 cigar. I missed that one. Yeah, but it comes in a humidor. Okay. <laughs> so I look at it as, is the cigar worth $300 or is that humidor box going to the cost of the per stick cigar? But from a just sheer cost analysis, you'd look at it. If I can fit, if the boxes cost the same and I can fit, or, you know, the cost of the actual box costs the same, but one is a 24 count box and one's a 10 count box, that box cost is split up among 10 cigars. First is 24. 24. Yeah. So that could be part of what goes into it. You're selling yeah. the cigars at in 10 counts. On the, flip, on the flip side, there's two sides of this kind of looking at it. There's probably multiple sides, but two sides is, if you're just buying one stick, okay, you might be paying more slightly. And this is slight when it's not a humidor box. I say, <laughs> oh, the humidor is valued at like, you know, $1,000. And it's like, well, then I don't well, like, it's, do it's, I get a, it's kind of like the, it's kind of like the, of that box. Or it's kind of like last year's, uh, uh, Cohiba Spectre. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that was a, that was a, what was it? A $1,200 box of cigars for yeah. 10 cigars. Yeah. Whereas the previous years they were all 90. like a hundred dollar ninety or yeah 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 they were all hundred dollar cigars. Yeah. This one's was one hundred ten, but it had you know it opened up and you had like the hydraulics lifted up and sure. stuff. It's like, well, shit, how much of that's the box cost? Yeah, you want to buy it by the box. You don't want to yeah. buy a cigar. It, well, but I think that yeah. goes into this just and this is a much more minor yeah. increase. But well, I, I remember when I worked for LFD, one of the cigars that we sold came in. I want to say it was a 50 or 60 count box and it had the tray. cabinet. Oh, okay. It had trays. Yeah. I think, I think it was, what was the limitado. I think it was, um, but it was like five trays of 10. So I think it was a 50 count box, but when we invoiced shops for it, yeah, like we actually invoiced that the box yeah. cost $200 yeah. and the cigars cost 300. Because in states where OTP tax is percentage instead of flat rate, it would help those retailers because they were paying less in OTP to in tobacco, tobacco tax. tax yeah. <laughs> Which I think, you know, in a sense that that brings even that that comment that I had or the, the speculation of what you're paying for, right, is the box, especially, especially when it is a a humidor that they say can be valued at what five hundred dollars. It's yeah. kind of like the response from the person I talked to today was literally it's like, well, they do the same thing. I'm not going to say which company it is, but they do the same thing. They they bill you for the cigars and the humidor box separately. 
he didn't say it like that. He basically just said, but the cigars are valued at the $30 MSRP. Free. Okay. So the humidor is free. So it's, it's all a semantic <laughs> um, <laughs> issue in my opinion. So it, it, it so, okay, whatever. So cigars are worth that. So sell it, for, so, shit. sell it for 30, but they invoice you for 10. He followed up by saying that, you know, they, they built the, they, they didn't do like it was LA blue style, but they built it in house. So it didn't cost nearly as much. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm curious, but we'll talk about it later. We'll talk about it later. Yeah. <laughs> but it, you know, again, neither here nor there. I mean, that's all part of the mystique, right? It's all part of the, 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 the enjoyment of, of owning a box or trying new cigars no one cares no one cares what the cost of the bottle is you know what i mean kind of like louis coming in the decanter you're like I, i'm just having a shot of it so can i get a little chunk of that decanter you can break me off a piece of that for that cost that you're making me pay to drink it that back rack crystal yeah like come on well like, I, oh, it's, that's why it costs so much it's like well i'm not fucking you're not giving me the bottle yeah, yeah. so what's the Unless juice you buy inside the, yeah. yeah what's the juice inside cost yeah it's kind of like the woodford baccarat yeah same, yeah same kind of thing yeah um that's got a little bit more age on it than regular woodford though um i actually had a, a couple come in a while back ago they used to own some liquor stores in another state and they had an empty bottle of louis the 13th yeah and they're like what what do we put in that like we don't want to just have it sitting on our bar empty but like what do we put in that and i went well, why don't because it so louis the 13th is made by remy martin I was like, well, why don't you just get Remy Martin XO, which is like 230, 250, somewhere in there, and then just pour it into that. No, you can't do that. They did. Uh, <laughs> did they sell it as Louis? No, 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 no. Okay. No, no. They, so for they, this for their they, home. That's for their home. Okay, okay. It's for their home. All right. Yeah. Because let's face it, most people aren't going to know the difference between Remy XO and Remy Louis 13th. Well, I mean, yeah, but if it's just your home bar. You it's just, your home bar. Yeah. It's yeah. like having a decanter. It's a decanter. You put whatever the fuck you want in. God damn right. You can put vodka in it for all I care. Don't put vodka in it. <laughs> it's not mine. They can do with it what they want. They can. Um, <laughs> I put on there underneath on the scrolling part, ask any questions on the comment feed. That's also for part two. We've got one so far. It's a pretty heavy one. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't mind doing it. Pretty laid back tonight. So, um yeah, if you guys have anything you want to talk about in part two, throw it up on the comment feed. Message us. We'll check the Facebook page as well. Um, but we'd love to hear from you guys. We don't really have a scheduled thing. Next week, we do have coming on uh, a trip from Barrelcraft. Fireball. So, James, that was commenting earlier. That's the Fireball Small Batch, the, the Dragon Reserve. Uh, James. So, Cinnamon Whiskey. Rested with charred oak for a fiery smoothness. I, James, have you cracked that? I don't know if you're still <laughs> listening. I'm super curious. <laughs> I don't know how smooth that uh, big red bottle is. <laughs> but yeah, I had someone come in. Like, wow, someone's going in and asking for a special fireball. Like, all right. Oversells. Yeah, that's right. Are you going to pour that? No. <laughs> What else we got in here? Uh, <laughs> still got still got some of those Nashville barrels. Oh, we do. We got some of the Echo stuff, which we are also scheduled um, for those that kind of plan ahead with us. On the 8th of May, we've got uh, Wes coming back on. Oh, nice. With the Echo Engineer Series. Yes, yes. Yeah. Been seeing that on social media quite a bit. Yeah, so, yeah, nice. good to have them on. Also trying to get Greg from the co-founder of uh, Watershed back on the show, hopefully in May as well, to go over the uncut, unfiltered to batch number two, which I saw at Kroger today. I have that. I bought a bottle. Did you? Yeah, so... Well, I think they're going to give us one for the show, so... Yeah. That's Hope why you I like it. That's why I didn't tell you that I got one, because I know you were talking to someone about getting one. Working so, on it. I know. Uh, I'm thinking about buying one, though, too. I, yeah, I still have the... One, so yeah, so last week, which I bought uh, last week at Carfagna's, um, we actually got in a few watershed products because for those that are listening live, if you live in the Columbus area, this Saturday from ten to twelve, Greg Lehman, co-founder of Watershed, will be at Carfagna's doing a bottle sign. We 
currently have the uncut, unfiltered batch two available for purchase. Have you tried it yet? I have not cracked it because I didn't know if I needed to save it for here. I don't think so. Um, but then so. also, and this one was a little, this one was a little weird. But uh, so when when Watershed does barrel picks, if there's uh, a chance for like a marketing thing, the whoever's doing the pick, they may only buy a certain number of cases, and then the distillery will keep back some cases and try and sell them through the bottle shop. You got to figure that out for the bourbon and BS community page. So a couple, there were a couple picks that were done years ago with their old five grain mash bill. That's that have the old label on it Oof. that came to Carfagna's. And, and one is pal police department, mm -hmm. which that one comes in at 118 proof. And the other one is Liberty Township Fire Department, which comes in at 130.4. So, of course, the firefighters go hotter. <laughs> Seems right. But I remember, but I remember years Especially ago. Especially in Liberty Township. Yeah. But I remember years ago going to the bottle shop and being able to try those. Yeah. Uh, because they were stuff that was for sale. And I ended up buying other single barrel picks. But yeah. Right. Currently, all three of those offerings from Watershed are available at Garfagna's and will be on Saturday when Greg's there. This Saturday. This Saturday. Nice. Nice. I'll see if I can uh, find the time tomorrow to put this audio up before some of the other back ones that we have just to get it out there. But uh, uh, end of part one, typically what we do is this. We rate the whiskey, which is pure Kentucky by Willett here, uh, and the cigar, which is the Oliva Serie V Maduro. And then we rate the pairing three different ratings, 10 being the best. And then you tell us why you think that completely subjective. So Nate, go ahead. You start anyone out there. If you've had the pure Kentucky, if you smoke the Oliva V uh, Maduro chime in on the comments and we'll, uh, we'll highlight those on the, on the screen here. So pure Kentucky XO coming out of Willet 12 year there, you know, at least 12. 107 proof. And I think that's why, to answer your question earlier, they don't put it on there because it could be more. Because um, a small batch. Yeah. Um, Not a but no, I, I, I really like this. Um, I've been holding on to this bottle for a little while to bring it onto the show because mm. um, I thought initially when I bought it, like, oh, we may not get this again. Well, now we have it on the shelf. Now it's one of those where I'm like, okay, if I, like I'll I can buy this forty five bucks. It's not yeah, and doesn't break the bank, and it's available. Yeah, and I I think for forty five bucks, hundred seven proof for what you're, I think this is a phenomenal bottle. Um, I'm gonna give in putting price into it. Yeah, I think price bumps it up a little bit. I'm I'm gonna do a nine on the bottle. Like this was really wow. you, you and I okay. both you and I both had kind of the same reaction that first sip. We're like, whoa, that's that's different. There's something different there. Yeah, that we don't taste a lot. And you and I drink a lot of whiskey. Um, so I mean, again, subjective, but yeah, <laughs> depends what scale you're going at. Oh, oh, okay. Um, I I diversify a little bit more. Yeah, because I drink a lot of wine. Um, but but no, I think I think this is an absolutely solid bottle. This is something that when I tell people what it is and they pass on it, I'm like, dude, you have no idea what you're missing out on. Um, like this but it's is not worth anything. It's worth forty five dollars. I this is worth buying and drinking. Yeah, this is that's what it's for. It's this is absolutely novelty. This is absolutely what worth put you know buying and putting on your bar and. Let's make a good cocktail too. Yeah, well, it would because it's got enough proof to stand up to that some would stuff. You've carry heard. some depth on just even your basic old fashioned. Oh or, yeah, mm. with some of those citrus notes that are in it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. this this would be killer. I, I think this is a very versatile bottle. And the chocolate notes. Yeah, it, this. Yeah, you don't have to use chocolate bitters. Um, no, the, I I think it's a killer bottle, and it, it's a shame that more people don't try this. Yeah, I yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, cigar. Fine. Cigar. I chime in with my rating on the box. <laughs> that's, that's it's really laid back tonight. I yeah, feel like, right. didn't it? Like it's kind of uh, yeah. in, a good, um, in a good way. I'm... Cigar. 
I mean, it's been a while since I've had a V Maduro. Me I'm going to, I'm going to say, too. I'm going to say it right now. I like this more than the regular V that richness, the chocolatiness. It's a little bit to me. It smokes smoother than the regular V. Like I absolutely V's got some spice. It does. The V does. It's got some spice. Does, yeah. Isn't that like a Sumatra wrapper? Ooh, we would ask that. I would. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna look that up while you talk. I think it's Habano. You say Sumatra. I think you might be right. Damn it. Or maybe the Milano is the Sumatra. Mm -mm. Um, but no, love this cigar. Uh, great smoke, great richness. The wrapper, when you look at it, it's got a little bit of toothiness to the wrapper. Um, I know it's Maduro, but and and you said it's San Andreas Maduro. Because of some of the other San Andreas cigars that we've had recently, um, like la last week, the DBS, wasn't that? Uh, San Andreas wrapper. Yeah, San Andreas Maduro. But broadly, that's a different blend, though, I know, altogether. I know, yeah. yeah, it is. But, um, no, the flavor the flavor on this cigar is phenomenal. Um, I'm going to give I'm going to give the cigar an 8.5. Okay. Which is higher than what I would rate the V. The V is still a solid cigar. I mean, my old shop, we had a couple of customers that went through a box a week different, yeah. of different sizes of the V. I mean, it's it's an absolutely phenomenal cigar. But this one, like that San Andreas Maduro, just in this blend, tastes completely different than a lot of San Andreas that we've had recently. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't have pegged it as a San Andreas, just because of recent experience with other San Andreas Maduros. As you smoke it, the flavor, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Like, and so, yeah, great smoke. Uh, as far as the pairing, I'll give the pairing an eight. Um, going cigar to whiskey, some of the sweetness up front uh, is accentuated. That stands out a little bit more. Going, wh going whiskey to cigar all of a sudden you get uh, more of that heat and more of the spice on the palate. Just overall. Overall. Okay. But going going cigar and then the whiskey, just that initial mouthfeel on the whiskey is a little bit brighter and sweeter. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. The bottle for me, what I was going to say when I was going to interrupt you, but I didn't, <laughs> was... Um, it's your garage. It's a generic-looking bottle. <laughs> so... The only thing that stands out about it is that long freaking neck. Yeah, and it's got the blue streak down the front. You know what I mean? It's not a bad one. And some people look at the label and go, man, that looks cheap. The 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 label, the Pure Kentucky, it looks like if this is on the shelf and you, uh, I'm telling you. Now, I don't remember the XO thing on there before. I wonder if that's new on that, on the, the new bottle. I've seen it on some of the old stubby ones when I looked it up okay. online. This sticker of pure Kentucky and the colors, it's great because it's a map. I get it. It's got the blue around it. Super bright blue. Mm. Um, Kentucky blue. But it's, it's bright. Oh, I mean, yeah, it's bold. Yeah. It's like a royal blue. It's, yeah. With all, you know, yeah. With the contrast turned all the way up. Or the color on a TV. Mm -hmm. you know, 100%. Um, yeah, it, it looks inexpensive. This is the type of... of um, sorry, Will. It, I know you're not listening, but uh, this this is a sticker that it looks like it should be on like a plastic uh, half gallon, like the JTS Brown. Oh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It just which is a great bottle. Fuck yeah! But I mean, the 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 the, the look. The it's got this bright blue, and then it's a kind of drab. It just it kind of just doesn't really pop. You know what I mean? So not knowing this is a Will it one. Um, if you were just looking and you're going into the, the the liquor store buying for someone else, you would think this. I think it it looks cheap. So it doesn't look like a forty five dollar bottle. No. Does it taste like one? Yeah, I was just commenting on <laughs> the, know, the marketing behind it. Yeah. Um, it's a small batch. You're saying that's give or take twelve years, depending on what you're dealing with. Uh, man. Yeah. Let's, let's get that popping a little bit more. <laughs> get that popping. In my opinion, get it popping a little bit more. You, you, and you focus a lot on marketing. This is coming from the company. Now, granted, Noah's Mill, kind of like a little bit more. Rowan's Creek, it's in the same. I don't know if they're, 
I'd be interested to talk to uh, Drew or someone from Willet and say, is this traditional marketing? Because like Rowan's Creek, that sticker looks cheap and expensive. Mm -hmm. And I love that bottle. Mm -hmm. But it does not look like a... It looks like a fifth grader wrote it. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The juice, talking about the juice, I, I'll give it... Um, Man, it's a lot of flavor. It's a lot of flavor. Um, I, I still love your initial reaction. Chocolate? No, or no, just my just face? Your facial reaction. Can't hear that on the audio. But I know. Yeah. And and that's why you tune in and watch us live every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. That uh, The chocolate in the end does stick around quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, the cigar has, has changed a bit. So that's why it didn't light up at first. I'll give the bottle 8.25. Okay. Um, it's funny. It's one of those that um, doing what we're doing tonight. I mean, we'll probably drink, you know, more of this. And the first sip, if you're just sipping at home, this is like maybe a one or two pour for the night. And it's like, I might, you know, that's, it's just a lot of flavor. And and it's not a that's not a bad thing by any means, but that lingering chocolate flavor is still there, and I really enjoy it. But it's it's just a lot. It is a lot. I was looking up uh, earlier, OHLQ what they had on yeah. their flavors. Yeah, cinnamon, toffee, caramel, pepper, oak, and spices. On the nose, uh, toffee, fruit, eucalyptus, and oak. Hmm. no chocolate nope maybe that's nope. their toffee for them could be yeah um the cigar i like this cigar i've liked it uh, ever since i've been smoking the oliva v maduro which was not in 08 when it said they came out it was probably the first one that i remember um was the the 2013 double robusto and it was such a good cigar you smoked it before i ever did it's such a good cigar. So I'll give this cigar 8.75. I think it's it's a very enjoyable cigar. When it was limited to one size per year, small quantities, it sold like crazy. Since it's become available, it's slowed down. We haven't carried it at, at the shop. Do you think that's because like it's lost that luster of being a limited special release? No. I think it gets lost in the what's new thing. So, uh, yeah, okay, it's related, but not exactly, okay. I'd say. I think it's related to what you're saying, but I think it's also the fact that it's like it's limited once a year. Yes, that gives you a little more pop, but it's something that it's it's not the what's new. So if, if you have it all the time on the shelf, even the Oliva V, I feel like, slows down unless you're a loyal Oliva V smoker. Mm -hmm. Because it's not new, it's just a solid smoke. I think it's starting to get picked up by more people that are branching into the fuller body stuff. And if you have your local tobacconist that is recommending that for you to try, people are happy with it. Very happy with it. So yeah, uh, eight point seven five. The pairing, I like the way you described that. I'm on board with you on that one. I think that it does complement each other in different ways. Going from cigar to whiskey, whiskey to cigar. I think it's a nice pairing. Actually, I'm gonna I forget what you said the pairing eight. was, but see, I was gonna go eight and a half, like okay. right in the middle of it. I think it, yeah. it just pairs pretty nicely together, especially as you know, I'm halfway through the cigar. Um, second glass, yeah. Um, yeah, it pairs better on the second glass, got through the cigar right off the rip. It was just a little bit much for me. Okay. You know, I was having flashbacks of our that Oliva V episode <laughs> with Wilkers, where I'm like Okay, this is just I. Well, this, okay. I'm on my fourth glass of water because I'm just like I need to like I you know. I well, that was the gym, and I I ate like a fucking pound of this beautiful chicken stuff that Kristen made, and I'm just like coming out here. I'm just I let the, like smoke or not smoke that, but I took a sip of that. And I'm like, all right, that's that's a lot of flavor, and then I'm smoking this and like, oh my god, so I'm just like chugging water here. So, 
Yeah, that that day you're referring to, that was an Oliva V with a Booker's Backyard Barbecue. That was 129.9 proof. Right. And it was in the summertime when it was like 90 degrees outside. It's a rough day. You and Jake were sweating your asses off. Rough day. <laughs> rough day. So uh, that being said, we'll round out part one. If you guys have any ideas for part two, we're going to hear from the audience and just kind of talk and see if it doesn't go very long doesn't go long if you guys want to hear uh the episode go longer as you guys are tuning in throw out some uh topics or respond to what we're talking about and we'll go from there but uh, i do want to thank you guys again patreon.com slash uh bourbon and bs podcast venmo at bourbon and bs we got the swag that we're wearing uh by jack.com slash bourbon and bs check that out that's available online printed to order for you shipped to you directly and you just pay on the website there. They're great people over at buyjack.com. And also, uh, I want to thank Tinderbox at Easton, Altus USA, BS Cigar Company. We appreciate uh, Tinderbox at Easton um, contributing this cigar, the Oliva V Maduro. It's available now there, along with a great selection of Oliva cigars, including that sampler we were referring to earlier. So check that out. Thank you, Altus USA. We're going to be lighting up another pretty stout cigar, that Monte Cristo 1935 anniversary number and two. It- and as good as this cigar paired with that whiskey, knowing what I know about that Monte Cristo 1935, ooh, I'm looking forward to that pairing. All right. Well, stay tuned, guys. Uh, for those listening live, we will stay live on the feed and uh, kind of do a quick intermission. Guys, happy Whiskey Wednesday. Cheers. Such a good clean. Nice. Those listening, we are on break right now, but if you have any topics, comments, whatever you guys want to talk about here, we are going to uh, hear from the audience. We got one, and it's a... It's a doozy. Jesus. Let's see if we got more right now. (laughs) I hope Ray is still listening. Was that on the community page, or was it on the page? Yeah, it must have been on the community page. Yeah, I think so. No, I think it was uh no, I think it was on the original podcast page. No, it was on the community page. Damn. 50-50 shot, you blew it. Story of my life. <laughs> How's your week been so far, Steve? Uh, pretty good actually. Okay. Pretty good. Um Yeah, <laughs> everything's going well. Um, well, we can start part part two like that. Lose smoke in the H up, man. Do you see that? Mm-hmm. H up in with the riff. new riff malt, single malt mm-hmm. with the signature on it, which is interesting. Or is that part I, of the? I didn't know. No, that's a signature. That's a distiller signature. Nice. Uh, I didn't know New Riff came out with a single malt. I don't. I know we haven't carried it. Um, I know last year OHLQ was pushing single malt <laughs> because they were the fastest growing category of whiskey in yeah. Ohio, or at least in the U.S. Some of those that they put out, like, they're still sitting on our shelves. New Riff's hit or miss. I think we've talked about it on the show before. Oh, I the think single it, barrels. Yeah. Oh. Hit or miss. I'm one for four. You're one for five. Yeah. <laughs> the only reason, and and mm-hmm. the other four, you and I have had those four together, mm-hmm. but there was one at. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Yes. Uh, New Riff Single Malt was limited distillery only release. Sold out fast. All right. That's why. I'm there you go, Lou. Cool. Lou got it. Awesome. Thanks, James. All right. Uh, yeah. I'm going to go start. See where it goes. Welcome back to the Bourbon and BS podcast, everyone. This is episode 311. Great band, by the way, 311. <laughs> I was waiting to see if you... <laughs> uh, this... 90s throwback there. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, this is part two, Beyond the BS. We are still puffing on both of us the uh, featured cigar from um, Oliva. This is the Siri V Maduro. We appreciate Tinderbox at Easton sponsoring the show and uh, contributing 
fireworks in the background uh, contributing to. Well, I mean, the, the, the cigar whiskey and pairing had great ratings. It did. No, I think this was a nice one. This was uh, this came together very nicely. You've been holding on to the bottle of the uh, Pure Kentucky XO for a while. A month. And I appreciate it, but no, which man, for me is a while. It's a while. It's a <laughs> Not while. as long as I held on to that Angel's Envy bottle. No, yeah, that was special. Yeah, you were the first person I ever shared that. With. That was nice, man. That was really nice. Um, but yeah, we're still sipping on the Pure Kentucky XO. We've got the uh, from Altus USA sponsoring the show. Part two cigar is a fantastic one. This is a top shelf one, Monte Cristo 1935 anniversary, the number two size. So we appreciate them um, supporting the show, and we look forward to smoking that here momentarily. We are part two, basically. We sometimes have a topic when we have a guest. It's nice that we can have kind of an interview a little bit, get their take on some stuff. Um, but tonight it's Nate and myself and you guys. So we're going to start with a topic that's going to be a heavy hitter right out of the rip. So we'll <laughs> see if that uh, kind of brings some other ideas. Maybe not quite as deep, but we'll see what's going on. Um, you were asking me about my week, <laughs> Ray, actually. Throughout another topic is, uh, has Steve packed for his trip yet? So <laughs> we got a busy month this month. It's good. Um, Kristen was supposed to travel for work, but her workload is actually so, so extreme right now that she actually stayed here in town so she could work from the home office and then basically remote virtual be a part of the, the conference as well as presenting while working on it. It's, it's a, it's a mess, but She's in town. We've got her parents flying in from Arizona on Friday, oh. staying at the house. Right. Her brother and sister-in-law are driving in on Saturday just to kind of get the family together. They're going to meet uh, some of my family, which would be nice. And, uh, yeah, so it would be a long weekend. And then we turn around after the following weekend, and we are flying to the DR on Monday the 22nd. So we've got a guest next week, trip from um, Barrel Craft Spirits. And uh, then the following week, we will not. Excuse me, we will not have a, a show unless Nate wants to do <laughs> a show kind of remotely, kind of or do like at least the the group thing. How are you? How's good. Week? It's been uh, it's been a good week. Weekend was good. Uh, I actually had to go to a I didn't have to sort of uh, went to a uh, industry wine tasting today from uh, one of our distributors. Uh, I didn't count how many wines I tasted, but I definitely didn't try them all. Um, one of the things I've learned going to the tastings is I either focus on uh, things I'm interested in, things our store carries, or things that could go on our shelf. And I try and limit to that. When Initially, when I start going to uh, tastings, try them all. I would go to the table. I'm like, all right, let's go. Whole lineup. Let's go. <laughs> uh, I mean, last month I went to one in Cincinnati. Um, it was their entire portfolio and it was 500 wines. Yeah. Which I'm sure if Kristen was watching this, she'd be like, that sounds like a dream day. <laughs> Five, you got 500 wines that you can try. I tried 104. Jesus. <laughs> Your palate's wrecked at that point, right? No. Because I would go, because every so often, um, I would either drink some water, swish around, or I would go find a table that had sparkling wine or champagne, and I would use that as a palate cleanser. Okay. I've learned a lot in, in the last 14 months. I believe it. I believe <laughs> it completely. But no, there were definitely some things today that uh, that I got to try that blew me away. Uh, and then, you know, as, as to be expected, there's a lot of stuff that I was like, eh, no. <laughs> yeah, I think that's normal, right? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I mean, I, there was anything from, you know, a $10 bottle of wine to a $300 bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. um, but no, it, it was definitely good because uh, I don't get to try a, a great deal of wines that that rep brings in. Um they have such an expansive portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot there. And so this was a great way to try some stuff and that that rep hasn't brought in before that we don't carry. Like, 
yeah, there were definitely some standouts that just based on the kind of store we have, I th- that I think could do really well. Nice. So. You got a trip coming up too. Yeah, at the end of the yeah, right. Yeah. At the very end of the month, uh Jess and I are finally going back to the it's now the Land Rover three day horse show. It used to be the Rolex three day show. Um now Land Rover's the main sponsor. But yeah, down in Lexington. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, we'll be driving down there on a Thursday night, coming back on a Monday. Uh but that's the first time we've been di- it'll be the first time we've been down there since I want to say maybe 2018 or 2019. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely looking forward to it. Good. Good. First, first actual vacation since, uh, 2021. Louisville. Uh, Nashville, Nashville. Louisville was in 2022 with you and I, right? It was in 21, but it was earlier in the year. Okay. Nice. Um, Sean's thrown out. Sean Anderson's thrown out. Some <laughs> I, I like that. that. I like that a lot. Um. All right. So you want to dive in with the first one? Sure. Oh boy. From Ray Cheshire. Thank you, Ray, for well, uh, see if this works. Your copy. Thank you, Ray, for uh, posting that on Ray uh, the post. Cheshire. Where is it? There you go. See if this works. Hey, there we go. All right. Buckle up here. <laughs> now we just got to wait for it to show. All right. There we go. All right. Ray Cheshire. Hmm. It's not always our specialty here, but um, no. We'll get your guys' comments on this one, too. Ray, thanks for, for offering this. This is an interesting one. With all the recent talk of, quote, online stalking, end quote who do you think is to blame the stalker the alleged victim for living their entire lives on social media or the social media sites themselves nate go ahead (laughs) (laughs) this is one of those that i'm like i look at that and okay you got three parties involved who's the one actually doing something wrong so i'm going to i'm going to go with the actual stalker is the the person to blame i do think however us as individuals we have a responsibility regarding how much of our lives we put out there so we have to take some some responsibility for that but just because you post stuff out there about your life, I don't think that necessarily uh, warrants having a stalker. That is, yeah, that that's going a whole different direction. So the blame, I think, falls on the stalker. I think, however, if there's some responsibility taken on the person posting stuff about their lives, that can mitigate that um as far as the media sites themselves i think that's one of those where if a user reports an issue that they're having with a follower that's when i think the the site has to take some responsibility like all right how do we handle this i think a lot of times uh the media sites go well they didn't say anything threatening so yeah well, we're going to leave it like I, one I, thing i will say knowing from this you know, running this show and running the like um, the podcast, the community page, the Tinderbox page. When you block someone, when was the last time you blocked someone on on social media or on Facebook? Let's start with that. Have you ever today? Because it was one of those spam comments. Oh, okay, like a spam comment where someone someone made a comment on a post that I had earlier in the week, like, "Hey, send me a friend request." Like, and it was this paragraph. Yeah. It's like, no, no, I don't I don't want to see well, you on my shit. When I block yeah. someone, it says it gives you options then. Do you just block this person? Or do you mute them? Or do you block this person in any new profiles that they create? Oh, yeah, I I go that. So my point was what you were saying. Like I think some there is they've taken a step further, you know, 
they've taken a step further that they actually can at least say, all right, this person gets blocked. You know, commu- uh, bourbon and, and cigar community page is different than a personal page where someone's like harassing someone. Oh yeah. But I do like that because say if like, if Joe Smith is the one being blocked, well, it's like Joe Smith can figure out he's blocked and then create a new profile, but they can realize that that person somehow is doing it. Right. So, or they try to. Yeah. So I think they've taken a little responsibility to that. I think, I think this one's pretty easy for me. The blame for the crime, if you want, I mean, like the, the, yeah, the blame is on the stalker. I yeah. Mean, the person committing the offensive act. Yeah. I, I think this whole, now, if you're just doing the victim mentality to get attention even further, that's a different situation. Um, I think that the, most of the time the stalker or the bully in a lot of the uh, social media type um, arena that you hear about, especially with the younger kids, you know, on social media. Yeah. It's the person that's, that's, that's committing the actions of it. Yeah. You know, it, it, in this day and age with, you know, putting more and more stuff out on social media, you know, he puts for living their entire life on social media. It's like, you could have a guy, girl, whatever. I mean, I think the more stereotypical thing is, is that there's, you know, an attractive girl getting harassed by, you know, creepy dudes or whatever. I mean, that's, that's the more, mm. I guess, um, in the, the, the public spotlight type of act. But I mean, there's people that, you know, like I, I follow, or, you know, I, I see a lot of the reels on like the, the fitness stuff and stuff like that. Like people are fucking mean. Oh God. You yes. know, it's like that, you know, if you don't like it, it's just like anything else. If you don't like what we're saying, you don't like watching the show, you don't like listening to the show, something's on TV that you don't like, turn it off. Yeah. You know, I mean, and if you want to leave like a review or a comment or whatever, and you say something, but if you now make it all about that's your mission in your life at this point, it's just to harass and stalk and, and do all that stuff. I mean, you're, you're clearly to blame on that. I, I don't know. I mean, the social media sites themselves, I think at a point where there was no holds barred, I think that's one thing. But as soon as they start, um, you know, it's funny, the, the, the give and take on that is as soon as this, the social media site, sites start manipulating and, um, you know, putting more, um, like basically they're, they're harnessing what's able to be done. They're, they're pulling back the reins on this stuff. Then people get upset that it's like, well, I thought this was like a free social, you know, free speech, social site here. You know what I mean? Like that's the other side of it. But even free speech has limitations. Well, and also you, you, you this can't is go not, in, you can't go into a mall or a movie theater and yell fire because that creates, that creates a panic or puts people in, da- in danger. Uh, yes. But even on these, these social media sites, like it's not, like it's a business mm-hmm. and people tend to forget that you're not just face-to-face interaction with someone or talking to them even on like a, a telephone like this is you're utilizing a platform that is now a lot of them are public you know traded companies but like you're still i mean this is it's it's a business mm-hmm. so you can't really blame them like that they did this they've given you a um a tool to do it now everyone's like blaming it just like they were blaming you know like video games and cell phone all, all any technology that comes out it ends up being blamed for things right so i think that you can't really blame the social media sites as much now yeah this it's the stalker absolutely you know it's the same thing if, if you know it's like you, you don't want to be harassed by someone. Well, then you basically have to stay at home and, and stay to yourself. And, and that's fine for some people, but no, I think that this is something that you should be able to put yourself out there to whatever extent you want to put yourself out there. And people don't need to harass you. If you're asking for opinions, then that's another thing. Yeah. Well, and then like, I think a good one that uh, Sean Anderson put up there kind of on this is, uh, like the girls that go into gyms and you know they wear let's say very revealing or skimpy attire and then they go and stand right in front of dudes that are just working out and then get pissed when that dude all of a sudden is checking out their ass it's like okay like you literally put yourself in front of that person with the, like you you knew exactly what you were doing
Yeah, to a I mean, point. Yeah. Um, and even in that that example, because I see that a lot on like social media as well, mm -hmm. I have never experienced at a gym where I see a girl, and maybe it's the gyms I go to where a girl like is like going off on someone for staring at them. Um, I think it's something that if you're in the gym doing something and someone's looking at you, it is to what extent this goes back to the whole thing is, are they stalking you? Did you catch someone checking you out? That's not a crime. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's, it's not, I mean, if they're being persistent and then they start taking it a step further, or every time you look, they're staring at you and not doing what they're supposed to be doing in the gym, which is working out. Now you've got a problem. Yes. Yeah. That's a problem. And that you can either address it to the person directly. If you're in a gym, you can direct it to, um, the, the personnel working mm -hmm. at the gym. I mean, you can address those types of things, but Sean, I mean, I think that's something that yes, that went a little too far, especially on social media where, you know, girls, they were like thing, you know, there was like parody videos of that, you know yeah, what I mean? But there were, yeah, I mean, that's just, that's a every day in life that whether you're in a gym or elsewhere, I mean, you're like, some people will get checked out and that's kind of to raise that's a good actually segue in my opinion from what Ray was saying. If you post every move to a public forum, then shouldn't you expect loons to jump in? Maybe. I mean, again, like it's like famous people. It's like that they go out to eat and you see those videos of like the celebrities flipping out because they just want to have a meal in peace and quiet and yet there's paparazzi there or the fans fans and asking them and like they're yeah. just like you know but to a point i think it's how you address it you always and I'm, no one's been in that situation but it's like you see certain celebrities that they're not necessarily putting out social media nowadays they a lot of them are but they put them like they're in the public eye because their job is to put things out like as an actor or whatever it is a celebrity if they're an athlete whatever it is they're an entertainer so that's part of it mm -hmm. But you know certain celebrities that are really well known to be super nice and they you know they sign autographs they do that and i think a lot of them will kind of be like they'll do it but if all of a sudden it becomes too much and be like all right guys i'm gonna go back to my meal yes and now it's please let me live my life now they've they've done their their job a little bit they have you know thank you so much autograph autograph all right guys that's enough for tonight like you know i just want to get back to what i'm doing i want to go back to shopping i want to go back to my meal whatever it is and then it does, is it a fan going to be like, oh, cool, or like the fan didn't get their way, so they're going to be like, kind of like yelling at a police officer, like I pay your salary, that kind of bullshit. You know what I mean? Like people just need it's on both sides. I think. I think on both sides. <laughs> what other comments are we getting on this stuff? What Tanya? Let me see. Mm. Most people use stalking in the online sense as I look through their publicly available stuff. Personally, I think if you post it publicly, you should expect that someone will see it. Yes. That said, it, when it goes beyond that and includes harassing messages or keeping track of your location or that kind of jazz, it's all actual stalking and it should be addressed. I agree. Yeah. I mean, we all have the right with social media out there to put things out there about ourselves i mean anyone who follows me on social media they're going to see a lot of pictures of whiskey and cigars <laughs> that's 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 what you're going to get cool. the vast majority of the time uh, well because that's what i post i don't get people I, i'll get people spamming me uh you know hey come follow this bourbon page no fuck off yeah you're probably just trying to scam people um you know, but it's, it's, if you're posting, like if I was in there, well, I'm a bad example to use. If you're, if you're posting bikini shots, you have a right to post bikini shots out there on social media. If that's yes, what you, you want to post, you have the right to do that. You absolutely do. Nate. Yes. If you want to post bikini shots, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Yeah. Wait, you saying you want me to post bikini shots? I'm going to block you. <laughs> No, I'll just put you on silent or whatever it is. Um, snooze, snooze on these these posts <laughs> the next thirty days. Um, I I do think though, and 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 it's not just women that do this; men do it as well. Um, 
but there there becomes a line you cross where you start posting stuff that entices other people and you share a little bit of the responsibility because that's what you put out there about yourself. You're going to get comments related to that. Some people take it over the edge and say inappropriate things and that's on them. They're saying those because of things you posted. So they're the ones doing something wrong, but yet you're also the one enticing people to do that. So there is a personal responsibility to where, like, if you're going to put that out there, you need to be prepared for certain people to say certain things. Now, if they're all of a sudden they're showing up at your house and peeking in your windows, that's that's a problem. Call 911 or shoot them. But, you know, the person the the person that's taking it too far is the person that bears the ultimate blame but you have a responsibility as what you put out there yeah i mean chris didn't even comment and if you saw her comment it's all about the privacy settings also like mm-hmm. kind of with all of these comments included it's it's if you put yourself out there you, you know people are mean man Don't people run. are fucking weird so if you put it out in the public arena See, yeah, so so Ray Cheshire says the person posting must take some of the responsibility, not throw their arms up and scream, what the fuck? I think to a point, you shouldn't be surprised. You're putting stuff out there, whether it's your opinion on a, a bottle of whiskey, right? If you're putting out, like you're talking about like bikini pics of Nate out there, you're going to get comments, especially if it's public. <laughs> Um, when things go viral, I haven't heard that used a lot lately. The viral thing, I think just everything's ex- expected to be viral possibly, you know what I mean? Um, but if, it, I mean, if it, if it gets attention, I mean, yeah, Ray, to a point, you can't just be like, oh man, what the hell? Like, what the fuck? It's, but yeah, you should just kind of like be able to say, all right, this person's inappropriate. I've never met them before. It's not, it's not the whole thing where. You know, that that bullshit I hear you guys are talking about like the gym stuff. I mean, it's always like that's that that creepy old man thing. Well, you know, if they didn't want me looking at her, like they wouldn't they she shouldn't have been wearing that. It's like, no, that's not that's kind of like that's the, not it. That's not that's not okay. Like take once that, again, if you if you are looking at another person, you check them out and they're offended that you actually check them out, you're I think a little bit too far there. If they are doing more than that or it's an extended period or if it's just like gawking at that point then yes that's a little bit much like remove yourself from the situation address it whatever it is but you can't stop people from being creepy or being over the line but you can somewhat if that's bothering you i'll say this if the the response is if if you are starting to get um upset about people responding to pictures of you of things your hobbies or because we all know like the more you get into a certain hobby then people get weird about it right they're just like (laughs) super fucking weird about it whether it be whiskey or otherwise cigars or otherwise um sports is a huge thing right you know like i have like i'm get all the things on my feeds about like the bears and shit like that people are fucking mean towards each other about a fucking football team you know what i mean like it's just weird you know, you can put your opinion on there, but it's like, then all of a sudden, like, it's like, you know, and then you go into the social media stuff about like the political stuff, the race stuff. I mean, you know, Ray, you started this conversation, but I mean, like I was literally now we're in election year again. And like I was following, it's a, um, I've mentioned it before, a famous comedian, a f- some of famous comedian, if you know who he is, I guess, but uh, definitely Uh, He's a black comedian and he's very political on his posts. And, you know, he posted Trump in a Chick-fil-A and he was talking to like, it was a lot of uh, black people, the customers in Atlanta. Yeah. And he said something about Biden and all this stuff. And this comedian's like, you know, oh, the comments are in there like, oh, he should go into a fucking church's chicken or something like that and try that. And I'm like, you just like, yes, everything, everything you post is fucking about race like and about like trump and it's like i think he's prepared for it so it's like but the community that follows that i look at the comments a lot of times 
and I've even thought about commenting, but I'm just like, no, because I'm, I'm like, as soon as then you know someone's gonna respond. As, like to I'm the, scrolling yeah. down, and someone comments about like something else, and it's like then someone's like, oh, you're about to go down. Let me tell you why. Blah blah blah. And it's like then it's like keyboard warriors and all this shit. I'm like, god damn, man. The hatred just runs so fucking deep in some of these people about some of these topics and stuff. And it's, yeah, remove yourself from it. Disengage the best you can. Well, I remember that. Or just keep doing what you're doing. Block the people you can and just keep, do you. I mean, like, just know that comes with the territory. It's just like being famous. Like, again, everyone's Instagram famous, you know, to some extent. So you're going to have someone comment about it. Or they're going to be, if it's more of a, a tighter circle, you know, just your friends and friends of friends. They might be talking about you behind your back, but just do you. I mean, like when we started this podcast, even now, I'm sure people are like, oh, man, they're still doing a podcast. Man, they have like, you know, whatever, a few hundred views or, you know, a thousand views. That's it. And I don't know why they do it. It's like, I, who cares? I don't fucking care what you say. You know what I mean? Like, it would have been nice four years ago that all of a sudden, like, we went viral and like got tens of thousands of people watching this. But it's like, we're doing it for us, doing it for the people that enjoy it people want to talk shit or whatever luckily they don't talk shit on like our social media feed yeah you know what i mean that i've seen but you know even if they did it's kind of like you know fuck you man like don't yeah. watch it yeah that's my response yeah well i mean and, and you and i both have a mutual friend uh that like a lot of times on a lot of times on social media they'll post a lot of just you know uh benign stuff out there like they'll post music videos and stuff like that but then when they get into a, a rut of posting political stuff, it just draws out arguments and fights between people. Mm -hmm. And there was one recently where you just commented, just stop. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, that's all you I thought, said. I just, thought about deleting it the next day, too. Just I was stop. like, ah, I got to see him tomorrow, probably. Yeah, you're like, just, dude, like, all you're doing is posting this out there to pick a fight with people. And you're literally providing a platform for other people to then fight. I felt ironically too, most of the people like 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 didn't see it the same way. So it's like <laughs> you're just like, I don't know what you're trying to do here. You're trying to change it. But we talked about that for for several episodes about echo chambers and trying yeah. to convince people of your beliefs, no matter what they are. On social media, it's, it's not going to work. Uh, Sean Anderson says, I won't lie. Sometimes I just uh, <laughs> egg them on and listen to them scream text. How they're going to get me fired up or whoop my ass. It's so entertaining because I can't be canceled. So, <laughs> of course, I can't be canceled. So, I... But the, I'm not going to encourage that behavior either. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, I mean, you're okay. going to do it, you do it, whatever. If that's your entertainment, I get it. Yeah, but I mean, that becomes the point where you're you're the one stirring the pot. Yeah. And then walking out of the kitchen. <laughs> Which in certain times that is fun. <laughs> like, like you're you're literally going, "Hey, I'm going to start some shit. Y'all have fun, and then I'm going to stage left." <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, well, wait a minute. These people are now getting into a fight and an argument. And you're the one that started this shit. If one more person <laughs> says shenanigans, I'm going to pistol whip them. Hey, yeah. Farva, what's that <laughs> restaurant you like to go to with all that shit on the walls? You mean shenanigans? And the mozzarella sticks? And the mozzarella sticks. Oh. You mean shenanigans? Oh. That's exactly what that is. <laughs> I like Mike Dieter's comment here. In a world full of different perspectives, personalities, interpretations, and responses, we should be prepared for whatever comes our way as a result before we make the choice to share any and all things about our personal life yes i mean mature in a mature sense yes i i also think that man there was a time where technology the way that you shared pictures and this is not way way back but before social media facebook remember um snapfish you ever hear of that mm. so you could like upload your digital pictures and then to snapfish and you can email the link to your family and friends and whoever you wanted to and then they could look at them, and if they wanted to get prints of them, they could order prints off of there, pay for the prints or whatever, and and do that. I'm sure it was like Polaroid or Fuji okay. Film or some 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 company was behind it, you know, to basically like to to make money off of printing pictures for people and mailing them, or you could like you could get the photo album or whatever it might be. But it was like we did that as a family, being here in Chicago and other places. But it was like you'd be able to like 
let me share the pictures from so and so's birthday or whatever. You know what I mean? Kind of nice instead of like getting together and be like, all right, this is gonna be our slideshow where you bring the pictures with you. It was between not Polaroid, but also like the just printing off like a, a developing film and then remember the digital one where you could print them off and all that stuff, but you'd still like you couldn't email big batches of pictures to people because the file size was too large. Okay. That was nice. Then I feel like social media, you could use it for that. Now it's your friends with everyone. As you know, some people, not everyone, some people have a very small group of friends. And like Kristen, my girlfriend, like she has privacy settings. So like if you're not friends with her, like you can't see shit. Oh yeah. I'm I'm the same way. Now if you're on like a group page, they can see what you put on the group page and stuff like that, but other than that you can't. I think that's very, very smart. Well, I mean, hell, we're at the day and age now where you can go to a you can go to a CVS with your phone and just say, Hey, can you print off this picture that I pulled yeah. up on Facebook? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, how times have changed. But I think you know, Mike's point is this yes, in a in a very socially aware state, yes, you should be prepared for whatever comes our way. I also think that, you know, a little bit more of an innocent take on that is you should be able to post stuff, but with the privacy settings in mind, just be prepared of who can see it. And if it is truly anyone out there, <laughs> uh, pick, yeah, pick what you want to put, what you, what you want to put out there. Cause once it's out there, it's out there. Yeah. I mean, you look at like the, uh, like the celebrity, like, you know, and photo leaks and oh, tweets and yeah. all that stuff. And you're just like, yeah, that that's an invasion of privacy because they did not put it out in a certain arena. It was a private thing, but then the hackers get in and do all that stuff. That's an invasion of privacy. If you are putting stuff out there willingly into a public arena and then you're upset that people are commenting about it, you can be upset about that, but you can't be upset that these people have seen it or, you, or, you, or read what you said Yeah, because, no, you did that. That's It's public. Yeah. Change your settings <laughs> if that's going to upset you. Hmm? That was a heavy one. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely uh, discussion worthy there, Ray. Oh, I don't know what else we can talk about at this point. <laughs> I think we – well, I think Sean had one a while back ago. See if I can. The towel. That's not what I was thinking. What do you say about a, a towel? Why do we consider a towel dirty if we dry ourselves off after we've come out of the shower? Something like that. Because it gets moldy. <laughs> and because you missed a spot. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> yeah. Because you didn't get everything you thought you did. <laughs> every every guy has a towel. This this side of the towel is for the head, the face, and then as you work down the body, and then you know. <laughs> and then the next day it forgets about all of that. Jesus. <laughs> oh boy. Anyone else got anything for us? <laughs> I was watching the uh, the news tonight, and man, there's some. As always, just some shit going down, and it's crazy with not only the election year, but then there was another shooting uh, in Philly. Bobby Shocker. Um, the holiday just ended. Ramadan? Yeah. There was a shooting at a celebration in Ramadan. Luckily, no one was killed, but five people were shot. It was just like spraying into a crowd. So by today's standards for the FBI, that – counts as a mass shooting 10 years ago wouldn't have i mean it, it was a shooting to a mass of people now you're just basically basing that on how many people got hit yeah which is pretty fucked up like if they're just like spraying bullets and they're just suck at shooting <laughs> like it's still a mass shooting oh i've seen videos i think where mass like... shooting should be now we're doing this shooting like um, um, like a certain amount of times in at a certain crowd of people, like that's a mass shooting. It's not the fact that like, oh, they only hit five people, not a mass shooting. It's like, but there was a thousand people there and they shot off, you know, a hundred rounds. That's a mass shooting. It's just they missed. 
so the not old, to make light of that, but if, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like that's that's still a, a mass shooting. So the the old definition used to be single shooter four dead minimum. Now it's just three people wounded. That's the current definition by FBI statistics. Yeah, just three people wounded. Well, most of those happen to be gang violence, drug deals gone bad, inner city violence. Like that's what most of those are. But anytime you hear it in the news, people automatically think like school shootings, theater shootings, church shootings, stuff like that. I had I had that discussion with a coworker yesterday. <laughs> of course you did. They brought it up, not me. <laughs> Sean, I'm trying to keep up with somebody's comments. Sean just keeps pointing up. I'm like, I don't know, Sean, I don't know what you're pointing at this point. He had posted something and then He's back on social media. Uh, oh. But he says, okay, so if you tried to fail and you succeed, which did, which one did you do? That was one I was trying to find earlier. Why would you try to fail? I think it was if you try but fail. He said, if you tried to fail and you succeed. Oh. You succeeded at sucking. Congratulations. No, he's saying if you tried to fail, it's like if you tried to miss the shot, but it went in. Which one did you do, succeed or fail? Well, so, okay, so if you're talking about sports, like, okay, you shoot your shot, basketball. You get those situations late in the game where maybe the team at the free throw line, they're down by one, or let's say they're down by two. Guy goes to the line, he's got two free throws, makes the first one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or let's say they're down three, make the first one. Well, you don't want to make the second because now you're still down by one, but the other team's got the ball. So sometimes they'll sit there and try and throw it off the front of the rim, intentionally miss, hoping that they get the rebound and have possession to either tie or win the game. But if all of a sudden they throw it and it goes in, it's like, well, shit, that's not what I wanted to do. So Yes, I scored a point for our team, but now right. the other team has the ball. From a strategy standpoint, you fucked up. Okay, so in life, what, what's the metaphor there? That's that's for you, Nate, and anyone else. Like Sean Anderson, who promoted that or put that out there. How does that relate in life then? Why are you trying to fail? What happens like, when like, they want when they want to to accomplish something you don't really don't want to? I don't. That doesn't make sense, Sean. What happens when they want to do accomplish something? Yeah, that, I don't understand what you're saying there. <laughs> He's been drinking. Yeah, I don't know. That's the whiskey <laughs> talking to the keyboard not working, but uh Well, I think maybe like you you don't want like let's say you're Man, I really don't want to ace this interview. I don't want this job, man. You're hired. Like, damn it. Well, you, well, you can always turn them down. Cause I've done that. Okay. So there don't take so, the interview. Well, no, there were times I went into an interview. And if you go into an interview, why would you like? Uh, no, no. There were times I went into an interview thinking it was a certain type of job. And then I go through the interview and I find out it's a multi level marketing. Okay. Nope. I, I had, I had one where I went through the initial interview. Like I didn't like, I, I thought it was a certain type of position. And then I do the first interview, interview, and the person tells me like what they do, and immediately there's red flags that get sent off in my head. I'm like, oh, this is a multi-level marketing thing. No, I'm not going to do this. And so, like after the interview, they're like, hey, we want you. You know, you did such a great job in the interview. We want you to go on to the next step, fill out this uh, questionnaire to go on to the next step, and you have 12 hours to do it. Nope, didn't do it. And then 12 hours later, I get an email like, hey, you failed to do this, so you're no longer considered a candidate for this position. Thank God. I didn't want, like, because there are some companies so, that when it comes to job postings, they will not post what, the, like, the true, all the information about What's wrong them. with just saying, oh, I'm not interested, actually, in this, but keep you in mind for other things. I mean, But if that's all they do, like if 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 that company is just based out doing multi level marketing, no you, thank you. But there was no one to talk to later. Like after I did the the 
after I did the okay. uh, like the Zoom yeah. thing, like, oh, there's 12 of us on this. Oh, I thought this was a one on one thing. And then there are certain keywords. I don't want to be rude and just like hang up in the middle of it. Why? You'd rather fail and they're like, this guy can't do it. No. It, you don't want to be rude? Yeah, it's more that. Like, okay. Just be okay, rude. Like, you ever see these people again? You're not going to use them as a reference. That's true. But that's really polite of you. Like, hey, to... you know what? I just realized what you're doing. It's a pyramid scheme. Fuck off. I'm out of here. <laughs> it's like egg, like you know, like just like stringing a date along, just because you don't want to be rude. Well, which sometimes I can understand, but yeah, other times you're just like, yep, no, I don't think this is going to work out. Yeah. And same result. This the sooner the sooner you put that out there, like, you know what? I don't think this is gonna work. Like this I think the sooner the better. I agree. Um maybe finish the date or whatever, but yeah. well, finish I, the meal. I, I had one there was a, rude. There was a girl I dated my senior year of high school that uh after we graduated, there were some things that I I just didn't have a good feeling about the relationship. And at that point, I'd always been the one getting dumped. I'd never dumped anyone. And so I didn't know how to handle that situation. It's sad and funny at the same time. Thanks, Steve. Uh, sad about the first part, and then the second part is kind of funny. <laughs> so I didn't like I didn't I didn't want to sit there and actually, you know, have a face to face confrontation and just dump her and be like, well, here's why. Man, people can't handle confrontation, not just you, but and and you know what I ended up doing? What? Not a fucking thing. And talk to her for two months. Ghosted her. Yep. Before that was even a term. Uh no, about well, maybe. Before it was a term. This is 2002. And 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 then I went off to Did college. Oh, hold on. See her? I went off to college. You just like snubbed her like in person. I went off to college. And I felt like shit the first two months of college because of the way I handled the situation. And so the first time I got a chance to come back home, which was for Thanksgiving break, oh. I messaged her to talk. Like on AOL? No, in person. No, he messaged her. Uh, through text because this was 2002. So I see a text. Um, but we had AOL I am <laughs> Tanya, stop it. Um, but no, and then you know, so yeah, we had that conversation and it was a it was a hard conversation to have. And at that point, she I should have just been like, fuck off. Yeah, but it was it was a chance for me to actually say like and and I admitted like, hey, I I was wrong. The way I handled this situation, I was wrong. I take responsibility. I take blame for that. You can hate me all you want for that. This is where I was at the time. And I didn't see it going forward. And I didn't know how to. You just gave me a thumbs up on the screen. <laughs> I didn't know how to convey that and communicate that to you. And that and that's, you know, a shortcoming on my side. And that's that's where I'm at. And she was angry. And I get it. Completely understand. And we went our separate ways. But there was something about it that was eating at me that I needed to actually have that conversation face to face. I thought it would be easier if I didn't have the conversation because then there wasn't the confrontation. Um, that was not the case. And so I learned from that. Like, nope, that's not the right way to handle you that. You basically situation. reopened the wound for your closure. I reopened it for myself, too. All right. You, were, you weren't interested. So what wound is that? Oh, no, I had to go through the fucking conversation. I didn't want to have that conversation. That's not really a but, wound. That's well, just re you were the one reopening the wound, pouring a little salt on it, and then be like, well, I, mean, I, I didn't reopen. Up. I didn't reopen shit. That wound was still open. I hope you I hope you heal. All right. Oh, you were already healing. OK. <laughs> Mike Dieter says, if you got ghosted on AIM, you knew it was over. True. <laughs> True. No, at least AIM, you had to be by a computer. So it was actually worse because it was almost like, it, oh, they, they just weren't weren't by the computer. Maybe they didn't get the, the message. Yeah. 
nope, maybe, I maybe their their roommate closed the window when they weren't there. Nope, I didn't have aim. <laughs> no, but that was something I that was something I learned the hard way. Like it was eating at me, and I kind of needed that closure. Communication, man. Yeah. Shock, shocker! How it always comes back to that sometimes. Always, sometimes. <laughs> Ray says, uh, do you really believe? I like this, actually. Um, let's see if I can find it here. Oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, do you re- do people really believe that certain human beha- behavior didn't exist until someone gave it a name? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's why I got a name is because it was behavior. That was becoming well, prevalent. I, With all the advances in technology... We ways. still we still have the same issues, just a new venue to experience those issues through. Mm-hmm. Like ghosting people, that's been around for centuries, millennia. But it's avoiding conflict. Yes. But now there's just a way to do it, you know, through you know, online. It's the same thing. It's just a different platform to do it. So okay, that's ghosting and, and this behavior. So in that situation, is it better to be not necessarily um, without feeling and just being cold hearted, being direct, but I mean, okay, do you just be direct with someone like that or you, 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 you approach the conflict head on and express your feelings and if not, why aren't you doing it? Um, or is it better to just kind of be, you step back and let it kind of take care of itself in your mind? In your case, in that situation, it just ate away at you because you felt guilty. I, I had stepped back hoping that it would take take care of itself. Did she keep reaching out or it was just like the silence on your end? You just started to be like, man, I really she, like for the, for the first should have m- said something. For like the first month she had been reaching out and then she stopped. And then it was eating away at me. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, I need closure on this, but she probably does as well because she doesn't know what the issue was. I'd be doing a disservice to her if I didn't have that conversation and say, here's what the problem was. I don't know, man. I think if you, I think if you happen to like run into that person, Hey, you know, really, I'm so sorry. I mean, I just didn't know how to handle it, like whatever. But to like seek that person out for closure, I don't know, man. I, don't, I think it's like you, you missed that boat. Like you, you could have, you, you didn't handle the conflict. I don't know. I mean, I get, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, I can understand the. I didn't. Hand, I did, you're saying I didn't handle it right by ghosting, and then I didn't handle it correctly. When I reached out to not correct, seek, not to right seek, or wrong, to seek uh, closure to it on my end. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the situation. I wasn't there. I mean, I get it that you, you wanted weren't. to put closure. You and I didn't know each other. <laughs> no, I know, but I mean, I, I get. I mean, there are some times in life where you know a person just kind of like disappears, or like someone that you really liked, or whatever, and it's just like you never hear from them again. I don't know. That might be healthier. I don't know. Never knowing why that sucks, but it's like you know to see them again and well, that was have to relive thing, like, that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not saying you did anything wrong. The, I mean, no. At, eh, the conversation, the conversation I had with that person, they were hung up on why I did what I did. Sure. And so I felt like having the conversation and explaining myself again. I I took responsibility and took blame for my part in it. But I then explained to him, well, here's the issue I was having with our relationship. And, like, yes, the responsibility for not handling it correctly was on me. The way things were in the relationship is on us. And it was kind of a closure on their end as well. A closure that I should have been upfront and provided them when it first happened when it first came to light instead of letting it drag on. Yeah. And then I learned that in college because then in college when I was dating a girl and there was an issue I had, I didn't drag that relationship on. I didn't ghost that person. I went to him and had a conversation and ended it right there. 
and it sucked for both of us, but I, I didn't waste any time. I didn't try and ghost that person. Rip that bandaid right off. Yep. And it, it allowed both parties to move on as, you know, as soon as possible after that. I think a lot more often than not, some people will do the back away without closing the door because they're worried to close the door. Because they're worried that they, uh, if they change their mind in the future, they they still have that opportunity. And it's like, oh, no, you, you, you probably don't because you still made the decision. You just didn't vocalize it. You just you your actions spoke the words for you. So, no, just just go with your gut. And there's a way to respond to that stuff. Right. I think is you. You say I, whatever it is, whether it be a job interview or whatever else, you know, so you try to keep the communication alive not not in relationships necessarily i'm not saying that like you know i can always go back to someone but it's like if you're not feeling it like just express it yeah say something well and and, you know there was there was a a week a few weeks ago where like after the cameras were off like you and i had a conversation yeah about stuff that i was going through yeah stuff i necessarily didn't want to have a conversation of (laughs) <laughs> sorry well i apologize yeah thank you um well the very the very next day i expressed that to you know the person i was having that issue with you addressed the issue yeah i addressed that very next day did you then i'm not as sorry <laughs> it hasn't gotten better <laughs> <laughs> like nothing's changed yeah but at least you put it out there i i did <laughs> And I put it out there. That's all I can do. And yep, there's that. <laughs> it's like, okay, I've done what I can. Ball's in your court now. Steve's just now lighting up the Monte Cristo 1935 anniversary number two. I'm doing it just to see if you're going to expand on that. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> no, I think it's important. To you're doing that waiting for me to fill time. <laughs> fill the silence. No. I hate when you fucking do that. <laughs> using the soft flame too <laughs> you son of a bitch no uh, no i think it's it's important to at least express yourself we talked about that you know relationships and the job and all that stuff man there's so many times in the job world more often in my previous career where it was like you just kind of and it, you don't just go spouting out the mouth you know what i mean you don't go like just like just every little thing you just react to, you know, sometimes you do have to have a little tact or, or reflect on something or, and, or, or know the arena of, Hey, like, Hey, can we talk about this? You know what I mean? It's not always a sign of weakness. And if expressing yourself is viewed as a sign of weakness or you're expressing a sign of weakness, then that's a a problem. You know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily, you always have to talk about your feelings, but it's like, if you don't agree with the way your job's going or certain projects going or, in a, in a relationship or whatever it might be. It's just like, you have to express that because it's just going to eat away at, at, the, at you, at the other party, just things are going to be off yeah. and you're avoiding that confrontation. You're avoiding the, the conversation of having that, that, that tough conversation sometimes. So, um, yeah, I think it's best that, yeah, like I said, I mean, with that situation, I, I would hope that my friends would do the same thing for me is that, you know, that was a tough conversation for you and I, and I, I, I didn't necessarily apologize for the conversation. It was more like, Hey, yeah. It's, well, it's just like, you know, I just don't, <laughs> sorry if I overstepped is what I said. You know what I mean? It was yeah, kind of like, but I was very blunt about my opinion of it. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't just the whiskey. It was but like, you're really, re- but even without whiskey, you're, you're really good at just poking to kind of get someone to talk about shit. When I know it's bothering them, they, they don't want to talk about it, but that's eating them up. Yep. It's like, I don't want to talk about this. I'm going to keep poking at you until you do. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, you, that's you that. Keep being upset and not talking about it. Or that's that. Can... And I always tell people that's that sociology degree in you. 
<laughs> like you always sit there and just keep asking and asking and asking and asking. And finally, we're like, fuck, I'm going to answer the question. Shit. Is that so hard? Yes. <laughs> Feel better? No, no. you will. <laughs> 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 talk to me in a week or a year whatever <laughs> we'll figure well but that's where you and i are different um mike says steve is very good at poking the bear yes um but i think that's what, mike you're welcome I, th I think that's that's one of the ways you and i are very different whereas you'll sit there and you know you'll keep asking questions to get someone to talk about it in hopes that they realize what an issue is and then they become more comfortable talking about that issue I'm more one of those where if you've got a problem, if you want to talk about it, I'll be there to listen. I'm not going to give, I'm not necessarily going to give you my opinion. I'll be there to listen. And you and I have had that experience in the past. Yeah, for sure. Where, Hey, something's weighing on your mind. I'm not, if, if you don't want to talk about it, I'm not going to ask. If you do want to talk about it, I'm here. And I will be an avenue for you to vent to. Yeah. If you want my advice, all you have to do is say, what do you think? Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you my two cents and you'll probably give me change. Um, you know, but that's where, that's where you and I are, are a little bit different in that aspect is, you know, if you want me to talk, I'll talk. If you want me to listen, I'll listen. You're more that, no, I want, I, I want you to talk because I want you to actually sound the problem out in your own, in your own mind. I, I want you to hear it. I don't like. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, no, you, spot on. I, I don't. I was talking with Kristen. Um, everyone's got different things going on in their lives and stuff, but it was like we were talking about how um people that we both work with, we both have, you know, we're friends with different. Not that we not necessarily shared friends, but like you know, people are. But it's like you don't see him for a while, and then and then you finally touch base with him, and you're like, you know, how's how's everything going? It's like, uh, I, it just works tough, and you know, family life's tough, or you know, health's tough, or blah. And it's like, uh, what are you doing? I just don't have, just don't have time to do anything. I don't have time to, you know, you know, exercise or do things that I like, and you know, all this stuff, and. You know, um, just things at home are a little, little tense, you know, um, jobs, a little, you know, overwhelming and stuff like that. And it's like, everyone gets in those modes. So I've been yeah. there. Um, but the big thing that I, I seem to see as the common theme a lot of times is when you do ask some of that stuff is, you know, it's like, well, I mean, what do you, not the, what are you going to do about necessarily, but it's like, so what's going on like with the job? Like they, have you addressed it? I mean, you have like a like a plan here. Like, what do you think you need to do? Like, I don't know. The things at home, it's like, well, have you have you talked about it? Have you you know addressed it? Have they addressed? You know, no, not really. It's like, well, you don't have time to to do any of your hobbies. You don't have time to work yeah. out. You don't have time to to do whatever. No. Uh, and, and we joke about it a lot on the show, not joke, but like we, we comment, but like even like her and I were talking about, it, it's like, but then they come back and be like, oh yeah. So what'd you do? Like, in, you know, well, I watched two seasons of, uh, such and such on Netflix. And you're like, did that solve your problem? Well, I mean, that's, you all need to escape. I mean, I like doing that sometimes too, but it's like all those things are so intertwined and it's like it's going back to the confrontation side of it. it's like you have to confront life situations sometimes it's like you know again the the conversation we had it was kind of like okay well and i know i said it or i'm pretty sure i said it, it was like all right so it's is it going to change if you just feel the way you feel and not talk about it i mean we talked about that with the jobs and stuff like that before yeah. too it's like yeah you're just going to, I mean, cause I was in those situations before my life. And I think more often now I'm not, cause I will address it almost stand up for myself in life and in situations. Yeah. Like I don't have a backup plan for every situation, but it's like, it doesn't mean that sometimes I'm not going to just go into it and just be like, you know what, this is how I'm feeling. Cause this is not fair to me. 
You know, I can sit back and just not address an issue. And it's like, that's what I did in, in my, uh, uh, marriage. It was like, there was some issues going on in my mind and I didn't address it. I tried to address it. And then it was just kind of status quo for a while. I did it in my last job, you know, my last career. I just kind of went along with it. I didn't address the things and I just got miserable and distant. And that's, I'm that's that. what happens. It's just, you can't, let it just go if you're gonna let it go then same thing as that like that girl that you were dating back back god knows when you just kind of let it just fester it just gets worse you yeah got, because I mean, you need yeah. sometimes closure is not necessarily the end in my opinion closure is more of like closure on the issue just just address the issue it may not be the outcome that you want but at least you fucking addressed it well, and that's what it was for me um, when I had that conversation, you know, but prior to, you know, in that example that I gave, I know that both of us were, you know, we were both torn about what was going on. We, we both had concerns about it. We both had pro you know, problems with what was going on. We didn't like the way things were handled. Mm -hmm. Both of us were having an issue with that. I took the the first move to be like, all right, I want to talk to you about this. And I put myself out there. I became vulnerable and be like, all right, here's, here's the issue I had. I'm sorry I didn't tell you about this. I, that's on me, but this is what was going on. And, you know, I'm, I'm sorry about the way things happened. When that conversation ended, when we parted ways, that other person still felt a certain way. They still had anger issues about the way things happened. Broke, broke her heart, man. And I, I was done. Like me having that conversation was a clear split for me. It wasn't a clear split for that other party. Um, I think had I handled things the way I should have, when I should have there, there would have been a time where both of us were hung up on it. And then eventually both of us moved away or both of us moved on, moved on. Yeah. Um, when, you know, when I didn't handle it, you know, when I ghosted that person and I didn't handle it the way I should have, um, it was eating at me, I think more than it was eating at that other person. Guilt. And then, Yes. And then after that conversation, it kind of flipped. I no longer had the guilt, but that person was still hung up on it. And, you know, all that, joking aside, I do think that you, you know, reopen the wound. Ray and Sean, what are we talking about? It's, it's, what I mean, what I'm talking about now at this point is that situation is a good example. We talked about where, you know, you and I had a conversation a couple weeks ago. It's having those tough conversations, you know, for for closure, but just the situation in itself. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to feel good, but at least you have some sort of resolve. Yeah. You have some, you've addressed and, it. And if you don't address shit, then it's going to be a problem going forward. And isn't that what we're looking for, resolve? If we have a problem, isn't resolve what we're looking for? At least growth or 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 the evolution of I because if you stick at it, you, you don't address something, you're just gonna fester on it. It might pass yeah. and it might get better, but more often than not, it's not going to. Yeah, resolution, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, we're looking for resolution. Thank you for correcting us on the resolve part, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think you do need resolution. I, I think you need some sort of like say closure is always this finite thing. I think sometimes it's closure on the issue at hand and, and it's, it's, it's not necessarily finite. You're not going to ever talk about it again, but at least you're going to like, all right, it's out there. It's addressed. If you can't talk to your partner, if you can't talk to your employer, if you can't have that honest conversation with yourself about whatever's bothering you, then you've got two issues going on. 
at that point. You have the issue that you're fucking dealing with that you won't deal with. And you have the issue of the fact that now it's just, it's an issue in your mind. And you're just pissed off all the time. So double suck. <laughs> Sean Anderson wants to talk about the fact that goals are not the, not the important thing. Sean, what's the important thing then? <laughs> well, I think when you're setting goals, <laughs> goals need to have a time frame and they need to be something that's actually attainable. Mm -hmm. I think some people set goals that are a little too extreme and they also don't set a timeline to it. So it's like, here's what I want to do. I don't care if it takes two years or 20 years. Well, then what's going to happen during the, the next 20 years getting to that goal? Like, I think sometimes if you, if you don't give yourself a timeline, you allow yourself delay to achieving that goal. Whereas if you actually sit there and say, I want to, like, if you sit there and say, hey, you know what? I want to lose 20 pounds. Well, when do you want to lose 20 pounds? Next 30 years? Well, is, is, is that really a way to make a goal? Mm-hmm. When do you want to lose 20 pounds? I want to lose 20 pounds in the next six months. Okay. Now we have to take some action. If you want to achieve that goal within that time frame, <clears throat> we're going to have to, we're actually going to have to do something. Cause I, I, I think there are a lot of goals, not all. I think there are a lot of goals that can be achieved by accident over time. And then there are, are some goals that actually take discipline and hard work to be able to achieve especially to achieve them when you want to achieve them good points i'm reading some of these comments as yeah well. yeah some some of our listeners like to post paragraphs <laughs> that's fine that's fine yeah some we, of them aren't we love the up. interaction we it's love the some of these comments aren't coming up on my feed but they're coming up on the big thing yeah you know? same here um like I think goals Ray says something about Americans, but I don't know what he commented I think, Americans about. I think I think the importance of goals is it keeps you moving forward. Because there are a lot of people that will achieve something that they've set out to achieve and then become complacent. Then they stop pushing, then they stop caring, they stop thriving, they 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 stop taking the next step. There are some people that only look to take the next step, so they never really uh, put effort into what they're actually doing. Like when I worked at AEP, uh, I had applied for uh, a management position of the, the team that I was on because in four years, I had four different managers mm -hmm. because every single one of those managers in between always looked at that position as the next step to the next position in their career. So they never truly invested themselves into that role. So when I interviewed for that position and they asked, they asked me the question, like, what do you think will be the greatest value to having you in this position? I flat out said, like, I'm not looking at this position to be a stepping stone for the next one. Like mm -hmm. if I take this position on, I'm going to be fully committed to this role and I'm going to be in that role for significantly longer than the people before me. <laughs> they didn't like that though. No, <laughs> there were some other issues about me. They didn't like, uh, but that's part uh, of the institution. But, and, but sure enough, when uh, it, it came down to me and one other person and the other person got the job and the manager above the position, when they talked to me, they're like, Hey, you know, don't feel down about it because I only expect this position, this person to be in this position for the next 18 to 24 months. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, so in two years, we're going to be right back here again. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, probably. I'm like, well, what if I could, what if I could tell you that we weren't going to be in this position for the next five years? That was the culture of that, that place. It was, it, it was the culture of that position. Right. And maybe not the place as a whole, but at least with that position, like literally it was a stepping stone to the next thing. 
I didn't view the position that way. And the managers, I the last three managers I had in that position, none of them were able to do my job. The manager I had when I first started, because they came from that role, that person was able to do my job. So if for some reason, someone on our team was sick or had to call off or there was an emergency, that that manager was in a position, they knew the job, they could step in and help the team. Right. Whereas the next three people in that role, none of them, none of them could help. If someone called off sick or someone had a family emergency, there wasn't a single manager in the next three to four years that was able to actually help the team. So it's like, okay, cool. You're my boss. Some shit got fucked up. Can you help us? No, I don't know how to do this. Well, then what good are you? <laughs> really? What good are you? I think you should at least know what your people do and how to do it. Fill in. You have to be as good as the other people, you know. Oh no, I was, um, because the last the last two people, the last two managers I had in that role had never done the job before. They had never done my job before. So if all of a sudden I was out, neither one of them were in a position to be able to do my job. Right. I'm like this number two. Video <clears> that <throat> that band's not that band's not good. Um, it sells <clears> it for <throat> gift buyers, but or for people trying stuff that are. It's just annoying. <laughs> um, it's a different kind of paper like construction paper let's, yeah it's added on uh ray comments on that does does being in the same position for a long time mean you're good at it or that you're not capable of moving on it could be both those it, reasons it, honestly yeah. not not same time uh it, yeah at the same time um it's to to nate in that situation if the culture is, is that this is a stepping stone position, we're going to do this for a little while. You're going to get kind of some, some better situation would be they learn what the people do below them so that in the next position, when they move on, they kind of have a better grasp at how the, the whole machine works. But if they're just doing that as a typical management role and not really don't care what they're managing, what, what arena um, that's okay. If you're good at what you do, Sometimes it is the opposite. You're really good at what you do, and that should be valued. But a lot of times at the top, they're looking at like the the the, the pay grades, right? So if you only do, if you're good at this level, um, but we want you to move on, you're like, I don't, I don't want to manage people. I want to do the job, right? I want to do what you were doing. You don't necessarily want to manage people doing what you're doing. It's the same that that age old thing of the best salesperson typically doesn't make the best sales manager. So let them be a salesperson. Like that's what they're good at. So if you don't have another role for them in the industry, a lot of times you do promote beyond their ceiling and they fail. So, yeah, so there's, there's both sides of it. If you're good at what you do and there isn't a way to continue to increase, you have to accept that like, okay, this is what I'm doing well. And this is the top of that you know, as far as the salary and everything else, and you want more money, it's like the position you're doing, you've capped out. So if you want more money, you got to do something else. You got to, you have to be promoted to something else. You want to stay there. You're very good at it. We'd love for you to move on. You want to stay there. We value what you're doing there. You're better than anyone else doing that, that role. Um, you make this, that we're done. We'll give you cost of living but you're not going to get any big raises because we're just going to, you know, basically hopefully uh, adjust for, you know, inflation or whatever, but cost of living, but it's, that's it. I think it can be both sides of that. Sometimes it's like, just let that salesperson, let that tech, you know, it's like if you're a good mechanic, it doesn't mean you can run the garage. Yeah. You just can't. Yeah. It's, well, Both sides of it. I mean, I I still I I still look at that uh, in my current role now. Like, just because I'm great at being able to sell the stuff on the floor doesn't mean I can necessarily do my director's job. You, I mean, there's they, a, there's a lot of uh, yes, he can do my job easily, but there's a lot of stuff that he does that right now I don't necessarily have the tool belt. Well, not right now to be able to do. 
uh, but then it's about okay, hey, tool belt's more about capacity. I think you might have the tool belt, maybe I don't know, but you don't necessarily have the tools. You weren't yes. trained. You haven't you haven't graduated to that point yet. Now that's from the 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 superior person in that organization or the organization itself should be training just in case if if your supervisor if he goes on a medical leave or whatever okay now what who's doing that person above him or now do you get pulled up or is it a mix if you have a indispensable person and one of the reasons they're indispensable is because there's been no effort to cross train there's a big problem and i've brought that up in my past there there have been times in the past where I've had someone in position over me where, you know, they've talked about, yeah, you know, people joke about wanting to do my job. And, and yet when I tell them to apply for it, they never do. Cause they don't want to do my job. And I've said to that person, like, well, why don't you train the people underneath you to be able to do your job? So that way, if something happens to you or you leave or you retire, there's someone and they're like, <laughs> yeah, no. Like, wait a minute like you you're just gonna brush it off like that like right so if all of a sudden something happens to you you're in a you know something tragic happens to you and you're incapacitated you can't do the job so there's no one then in the company that can do your job like, yeah it's job security in the moment that's it for them yeah sean says i read something a while back that said you will fail or you'll fall to the level of the systems and processes that you put in place that create habits. So setting the goal, this is him talking about the goals again. So setting the goal is not the important thing. The system's put in place to get the goal. I assume is the important thing. So I think that a lot of times is, for me, the goal, Sean, because he, he posted that twice. I think the goal is still important, but sometimes you have to work backwards from it figure out how to get there. And now it's, it's step one. You're not just going to get to the goal, but you still want to get to the finish line. Right? So it's, do you have to train differently? Do you have to take step by step? Do you have to take the turns you need to take? But, but at some point you need to still focus on the goal at hand. Right? Don't you think? Hmm. What does Diane say? It's a big one. Yeah. Haven't read it yet kind of crazy though you come up with what you think is a new innovative idea and then i then you find someone else thought of it it's not a bad idea though so then you weigh to tr to try it and hope it succeeds even though someone else did it before you and then on the other hand you have those that would say well someone else already did it then maybe you could do that and even more. I guess that's sales. I, I I would say a lot of times that I've been in positions um, both sides of that. Where I'm like, hey, why don't you try this? Oh, we, we tried that before. Didn't work. I've been on the other side where someone approached me about it and it's like, yeah, we tried that before. It didn't work. <laughs> um, there, that's uh, That's a tough one because you don't want to stifle someone's creativity by just saying, yeah, we did that before. It didn't work. And then it's like, well, fuck me then. Right. You know, I tried. It's like, I think the other thing is though, you say, this is how we did it before. It didn't work. These are the reasons why we didn't think it worked. How do you think we do it differently? Yeah. So and you try to, to harness that creativity of that person. And honestly, the eagerness of that person that wants to try to do, something they're trying to think about it they don't know you tried it before in the past yeah. when did you try it was it last month or like 10 years ago yeah why didn't it work because things, sometimes the things people didn't buy in yeah things change over time so an idea that may not have worked five ten years ago could work now it depends on you know it depends on the people in the organization it depends on the climate of you know that particular industry you know that that idea may have been too ahead of its time for that company. Yeah. And now things have changed. Well, oh, you know, we need to do this. Well, you know what? This idea try, you know, we tried this idea eight years ago. Yeah, but no one was ready for that. 
like there wasn't the infrastructure in place to be able to pull it off. Now we have the tools to be able to do that. So now it is a good idea. We can work towards that. So, so I mean, sometimes the people in the organization change and sometimes the environment within the industry changes that could allow for an idea to take place and be executed better than what it was originally. Sometimes because no one wanted to actually really execute the, the idea. <laughs> maybe you didn't. Ha- yeah. Maybe you didn't have the right personnel to be able to pull it off. Man, I tell you what, like going back to my uh, my moving to storage days, like what I see that, you know, from afar through social media, and um, I drive by the office now going to the gym a few times a week. The idea is that moving in storage, right? And now it's like, oh, we're going to do junk removal. And I'm like, if I was still there, I'd be like, no, thank you. I do not want to have to. Like, we have a hard enough what time. Is, what was it? Junk removal. Junk. Okay, junk removal. Okay. Like like one eight hundred got junk is yep. was a thing. Yep. And we're moving in storage. Like, hey, we should do junk. Hunks removal. Hall and junk. And they're like, we want to junk removal. I'm like, I, we we can't. We are a revolving door just to get movers and drivers in. Now you want to get guys and girls in here to haul junk away and not get hurt doing it. Nope. <laughs> so good for them that I'm not there anymore. Hindsight's twenty twenty on both sides of that. Yeah, I like what I'm doing now more than I like. I think I was good in that that those different positions, but it's like this whole vision of like, hey, let's do this part of it. The company wasn't in a position to be able pass. to do it at that time. Pass. <laughs> to this day, I'm like, no. Well, like I mean, within like, reason, it's like, oh, you want us to take a bulk item like a refrigerator to the to the dump? Okay, I'll do that. But it's like you just want to go into a basement and like, hey, I want to take all this stuff, throw it out. I'm like, <laughs> this is wet. Which I did touch some, yeah. But like bad moving stories there. Well, like when you were in the moving and storage industry, if you had a hard time just being able to fill the obligations of moving, when customers would sit there and say, "Hey, I'm going to hire you guys to move me from this house to this house," and you had a struggle just to be able to have enough personnel to be able to do that, that means that if the company decided to add on to their portfolio junk removal. Okay. Can we can we can perf- we bring on another twenty staff members to can do we it? Perfect what we're doing now first. <laughs> Where there is that. Too. Ironically, I've run into people. The the guy that delivered my washer and dryer, the the guy that uh, was the point person on the move, Kristen moving into my house. Both of those people, just in conversation, started at the company I was at. After like right after I I left, <laughs> and. Just saying, yeah, I was in the moving and storage industry. You're like, oh, yeah, where were we at? And I told them the company. I was like, oh, that's where I started. And we started similar names around that time and all that stuff. And I'm like, so, yeah, so why'd you leave? He's like, yeah, it's just not. <laughs> I didn't really like the direction. I mean, they, they seem to be doing really well, so that's great. But it's yeah. like, it's, I'm not, I don't wish any but then, will. But, then, but like, you're just like, oh, so like we get along. We see the same thing from different so perspectives. You, so the company you were with, uh, they want to diversify and be like, we'll do moving and we'll do junk removal, yeah. but they didn't necessarily have the personnel to be able to do both. And then all of a sudden there's a company that comes up and like, we're going to focus only on the removal part. And that business starts taking off. And you're like, well, shit, see, and well, and that's where you have upper management sitting there. Maybe, like, like, see, we I- could have done this, this other company, j- yeah, I guess maybe what? I lack the vision. Because... That co- that company, all they do is the junk removal. They don't move people from place to place like we do. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, they're successful because they're hyper focused on a specific task. We're trying to diversify into multiple arenas, but we only have personnel to be able to do one. It's like you you can't you don't have an. If you want, like I said, if you want to hire on another 20, 30 people to be able to take on that Just other. That. You're starting a new business. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're, you're starting a whole new portfolio of the company, a whole new division of the company. You have to bring people on. That's the same thing. Uh, AEP, my last. Uh, and we have some heavy comments. My last on. employer, you know, my last employer, AEP. Okay. They got a bunch of utility companies. They got power companies, all that stuff. And then they decided to go into the retail. 
what they have to do. They started from absolute ground zero. They brought people on to be able to do that job. And then as time went on, they were able to bring in more and more people into that division. But it was people that were focused only on that division. So you had people who were focused on doing business to business sales. They weren't doing like selling power plant electricity to power companies or to uh, utility companies. They weren't sitting there trying to do the jobs of multiple companies. They were just focused on one aspect of the business. Yeah. So sometimes you can take a great employee, that great employee is great because they're focused on a specific aspect of the job. If you try and add too much onto their plate, that's not within that realm. You stretch them too thin. You're like, Hey, we want you to do some of this stuff. Okay. Well, you do realize if I spend time doing this stuff, my sales numbers are probably going to go down because I'm not spending as much time doing that. No, you got to keep your sales numbers up. Mm -hmm. Well, wait, what am I, what am I going to be graded on? At the end of the year, am I going to be great on my sales? Am I going to be great on doing the stuff for the other part of the company? Well, yeah. you're going to be great on both. Well, wait a minute. How? Yeah. People, I, like the, ama the amount of time I have in a day only allows me to do this aspect of the job. Like, yeah. If you want someone to be able to do that, you have to bring on someone who can do that. Let's uh, do our last uh, comment on night. And, and Diana was... Diana, are you a teacher? Sorry if we don't uh, know this already. I know I see you on there all the time. Um, talk about the new and innovative ideas. I had a thought of a bulletproof. This is serious right now because this just happened again. We're, they were actually dealing with a previous one on the news tonight. Mm. I had a thought of a bulletproof backpack when all the shooting were happening at the schools, but someone had already thought of it. So I let it go. Only one person had prototyped it previously. I kind of kick myself now for not moving on it. And uh, Ray says, or send your kids to school in bulletproof jackets. Sad. Um, Diana says, yes, this is true. And there's Sean. Sean says, put a couple armed folks at the doors and you won't have such situations that's well there is some truth to that um maybe yeah, in the schools that have actual arm special duty cops have had shootings so yes that happens but like even you know like to that when you think about to that uh uh the movie theater shooting years ago like there were five other movie theaters closer to that person but they all had armed guards, so they all had security. That person picked a movie theater that didn't. Yeah, you can have so, deterrence of all that stuff for sure. Yeah, you yeah you can have you can have deterrence in place. Someone's still gonna fuck around. Hopefully, you have personnel that's gonna make them find out. <laughs> nah. Resp um, response time is amazing. Dan says not just had a kid that was in school and it bothered me, so I had to uh, start thinking of how to protect the kids. Um, <laughs> I, I'm of the opinion that um, evil's gonna happen. Yeah, you, you can. The only the only thing you can do is put yourself in the best situation possible to be able to handle that. You're never gonna outthink it. You're never gonna outpace evil. Evil's always gonna find a way around. Doesn't matter what steps you take. If some if someone wants to do something bad, they're going to do it somewhere. They're going to find a way. Shit's happening everywhere, man. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate. Uh, it's sad. Um, the only thing you can do is be prepared for when it happens. You hope to God you never have to. Uh, you can only put yourself in a position to be able to handle it when and if it comes up. You know. Nate and I have not necessarily different mindsets on this, but obviously, you know, you carry all the time. I don't, I don't even own a gun. Um, I, I just look at the comments here. There's preventative measures. I mean, you don't want to, it's funny because 
I know it costs money and stuff like that, but you combine some of the thoughts there where, um, you know, Sean and you say, yeah, let's put some armed people at the, those types of things, uh, schools and stuff like that. Um, and I'm not oversimplifying, but cut a couple of administrative people and, and put some metal detectors coming into school. I mean, that's going to help, right? You, you have, uh, or pay those administrative people to, to know how to, I don't know how much metal detectors cost, you know, as far as like the, you know, the mm -hmm. walkthrough type things, get two of those, you slow it down and you bring people through that to still find a way, right? I mean, yep. you're still going to find a way, but at least that would minimize it. The, the, sometimes you know i think like with driving you know the best defense of driving is being on the offense right you know what i mean like you sometimes gas absolutely the, the, but i i think that there's there's ways in that way so you know diana saying you know bulletproof backpacks what if they shoot you in the front i mean to be blunt i mean yeah. that's one of those things so yes you could send every kid in there with flak jackets and that's what they're walking around in Metal detectors, I know they started instituting those in some some schools in very bad areas years and years ago. Oh, yeah. Um, they're going to find a way. There's no simple solution to what you said about the, the evil will present itself. I think that this is happening everywhere uh, where where I work and you work part time. You know, at Easton, it gets a bad rap. It's still such a nice area. Everyone likes it. Ah, I won't go up there after. It's like anywhere you go, mm -hmm. shit's happening. So. I think it's about training your, your your or not training, but it's teaching your kids, teaching you know yourself to try to, if possible, get yourself in the best situation all the time. Surround yourself in in good surroundings if you can. If you're going to a bad area, if you if you're you're living if you're you're brought up in a tough area, you know, a lot of these shootings that you hear about aren't in bad areas. They're actually in suburbs and shit that are happening. The mass shootings, not to define it, but a lot of that's happening there because you don't hear about the, the, the gang violence so much because we're so desensitized to that stuff. I do think that it's, you know, the best you can do is <sighs> to sound real hippie like here, but like, just try to, can we all just get a no try to present try to live yourself your life in the best positive way that you can treat people something that i try i've always tried to live by not even realizing at the time but looking back is sounds a little bit selfish but at the same time it's supposed to be um with the best intentions but if you're treating people the best that you can the way that you if more people treated everyone in a nice way if everyone treated people like they were fucking human beings strangers don't know that but in these schools and stuff like that a lot of times there are people that are targeted teachers students and all that stuff that are targeted sometimes it is absolutely just mass chaos and there's no rhyme or reason to it um, or there's innocent bystanders you hear about like you know some of the the kids or faculty that are you know basically trying to shield other people and they're the ones get shot that's terrible it's all terrible but i just think that sometimes and i'll even joke about it sometimes when you have like a a weird we have we'll have like a this bear with me like we have like a weird customer and they're just a constant person and they're you see some people's interactions with them and they just don't have any tolerance for that person because they're just like they're just off Right. And I'll joke about it, not necessarily to their face. And this sounds terrible. And it's, I'm, I try to be nice to everyone in my own way. Sometimes it's some sarcastic asshole and, you know, sometimes come across that way. But a lot of times it's like jokingly, I'll say, well, yeah, they are weird, but I'm just going to be nice to them and treat them like normal, sometimes even extra nice. So, so that I, I don't want to end up in their basement, like in their next soup. <laughs> so, you, you you know, someone that I've been nice to my whole life and all of a sudden they turn out to be like some serial killer or 
whatever it might be. And it's like, thinking, why don't you think that you were targeted? I think like, Billy Madison. Yeah, like I'm, I'm gonna so apologize glad I, and then you just so glad I called that guy. I mean, it's like that's it's, you treat people that way and you minimize. I feel like you can't you can't eliminate the randomness. But if you're just fucking nice to people, I think you minimize it a little bit. If you're the bully, if you're the one that just treats people like shit, I feel like you're going to be more of the problem. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, that's, I don't know. That's the way I look at it. It's just... So I don't know if I ever told you this, but uh, <clears throat> when, uh, when I was a senior in high school, all through grade school, I I got bullied constantly. You told me that. And there was one day in my senior year of high school, we were in a class, and one of the one of the people who was a bully to me actually said to me that they think I was gonna be the next school shooter. Nice. And I, I said to that person, I'm like, well, why do you think I'm going to do that? I'm like, well, we, we give you shit all the time and you never do anything about it. <laughs> and so we think one day you're just going to explode. And I was like, okay, so does that mean you're going to stop? Does that mean you're going to keep giving me shit? And they're like, no. And I was like, okay, well, then don't be surprised. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you didn't act on that. Yeah, so am I. Jesus. <laughs> I was like, I've seen a different side of Nate tonight. <laughs> that side's been there for 30 years. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's like if you treat people like shit, don't be surprised when they have no value, they don't care about you whatsoever. Because you've treated them like shit, they're gonna view you in the same light. That goes, I mean, that goes to your point. Like, treat everyone like they're a human being. Like, treat them nicely. So they're lucky Doesn't that be- you're a good person. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. I mean, like, they they bullied the the per. They were lucky they bullied the person. They bully the people they don't think will defend themselves. But then the but moment that comments weird though that from that person. But. <laughs> But like I, I had one bully that I actually at one point did stand up to myself and defend myself, and that person and I got into a physical altercation, and I came out on top. That person never fucked with me again. Right. But again, that was a time when, in school, I dealt with this. My dad dealt with this. An uncle of mine dealt with this. Where we all had our bullies. And then we dealt with that particular person and in a, and yes, in a physical way, whether it be a, you know, punches thrown or, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, you, you knock the kid out or you throw, you, you know, you shove him in his locker and he never, and you know, once he realizes shit, this person's a lot tougher than I am. They stop fucking with you. Yeah. Now that does I never I never took a weapon to school. I never threatened anyone with violence. It was just one of those where there was a point where I just got tired of dealing with it over and over. And I finally stood up for myself. Didn't stop poking you, is that what you're saying? <laughs> they did. <laughs> I'm not gonna sit there and say I'm gonna get in a fight with you. You probably kick my ass. No. But um but no, I mean, and and that's the conversation I had with someone recently. It's like we've got away from those days where if someone was getting picked on in school, all right, after school, you and me, parking lot, we're gonna we're gonna figure it out right now. And you do that, and that's the end of it. It ends right there. We get into a fight, one of us wins, or we draw, whatever it is, we get in a fight. That's it. It's done. We no longer mess with each other. I think I think nowadays that doesn't happen. And so you have people that just build on that and they just and it just keeps that angst just keeps building and building and building in them. And then they take it to the extreme level because also they don't value human life. And that's a big difference. 
I I grew I grew up uh you know, at a very young age I grew up with firearms uh but I I remember a specific time down in Kentucky when we were doing target shooting um you know someone had shot some cans that were sitting at the ground with a shotgun and it literally just left a rut in the ground and we all just looked at each other and we're like good lord could you imagine what that would do to a person and it provided a different look at it you like you you all of a sudden valued the tool and you also valued the person like i wouldn't want to see that let alone do that to someone else right and you know and that's one of the reasons why i never did anything to that extreme that was your upbringing man yeah i also didn't want to throw my life away for that little fucker Because I also knew that once I graduated, I was never going to see that person again. They were no longer going to have an impact on my life. So why am I going to create a long-term problem or why am I going to create a, uh, a long-term problem to a short-term problem? Like, no, I, I mean, I, I, I understand that that's, that's the level of rationale that Ira has. And, you know, Ray puts it out there who hasn't been bullied at some point in their life. It's part of growing up, which true but there are some people that just take it to the extreme absolutely uh you deal with it you grow up and you get over it you don't fucking kill people i didn't no I did. <laughs> no i know it's good i, I didn't uh, i mean yeah i i got i got i mean there there was a time where well so i want to comment to my knowledge yeah uh, um yeah, you dealt with divorce. You, you've shared that on the show, but you've had good role models in your life. Yeah. You've had good support systems. I think that's the other part of it that I, I hope that, you know, is, and again, everyone fuck has different fucking things in their life that you hear these stories. And like I just saw on the news that, you know, now there's parents of the, one of these shootings that uh, they're getting, they're getting 10 to 15 years, both parents. Well, that, because they because bought- the, I I know I know so it's, it's all about circumstances we can't solve the world's problems necessarily but I agree with what Ray says Nate thank you for sharing that part that's a, that's a tough situation I mean we've all been bullied we've all felt like shit especially as adolescents you know what I mean um, as kids it sucks as as preteen teenagers it sucks um, I'm not going to share it but I mean I, I've got um, you know, someone in, in my family that, you know, that they're dealing, they, they've dealt with it as in childhood currently, you know, being bullied. And when I found out about it, it was like, yeah, I, my initial response was like, as, as the role in that person's life, it's like, I want to get involved, but to a point you try to learn more about the situation. You try to like, try to support you try to teach you know other aspects of the life that hopefully there's character building there and um man this yeah this is a a heavy part two but uh (laughs) you hope that you have support and i know you you laugh at it because we you know you, you talk about it Mm -hmm. the more you you hold in if you're being bullied if you're in a tough situation and these will be my you know closing remarks here but if you're gonna round it out here but um i i think the more that you hold it in and you don't express it you don't you don't ask for advice if you ask for advice and they're like yeah you need to go kill that person well it's like you're already in the wrong situation it's probably Um, the wrong person to ask if you are you know, yeah, the good old days, right? Good old days. You <laughs> you get in a fight with someone, you know what I mean? Like, that's not good. But if someone's picking on you or, you know, like, and it gets physical, like, you stand up for yourself eventually. You may not win the fight or anything like that, but at least you stood up for yourself. I'm not promoting violence in any way. I am more of the... We've talked I, about it. I, I always used to say, I may not win the fight, but you're going to know you were in one. I try to deflect to a point where, especially, you know, even when I was younger, same thing. It was very, very rarely 
in my life, like extremely rare to, to go to violence, but I broke up more fights than I was in because <laughs> I was more in the background. I, I, you know what I mean? I just, I, I chose my angles of mm -hmm. being in situations and stuff like that. And as I, I grew up through my teens, twenties, thirties, and now my forties is, um, I've reacted to those situations in my life where um, I try not to put myself in those situations. Yeah. And, you know, I look at it as not everyone has those opportunities. Sometimes it's in your face and you cannot get away from it because of life circumstances. But there's always a way that you can do your best to not get to the violent side of things remove yourself from the situation remove yourself it's from the situation or confront it in a in a, in a, a um, intelligent way and the best thing you can do i think is is to put yourself in a situation where you yes i know you laugh at it but communication sometimes you cannot talk to that that other party you cannot god damn it i'm gonna try you know, us getting in a fight, what's it going to solve? You Like, you uh, you know some of the stories, you know. You guys get in a fight right now, like, breaking it up, you know, like, even talking. You want to fight this person, what's it going to solve? Yeah. You guys ready to, like, get pulled out of here, thrown out of here, you know, wherever we are, or whatever the situation is? You ready to, like, do jail time over fucking you got disrespected? Like, you try to talk it through. Put in perspective. L logic, a lot of the times we'll put things into perspective. Like you said that, and I'm not talking, I know Sean's listening right now. I'm not talking about extreme situations where guns are pulled. You're in a, 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 a war mentality or anything like that, but I'm talking everyday life, not even the extremes, but everyday life confront the situation, talk about it, figure it out before it gets to the extremes, whether it be violence, whether it be, uh, finality, like the, the final steps of like a relationship, a job or whatever. It's like, just start processing it because a lot, I, I think more times than, than not, you're going to be able to resolve the situation in an effective way that you feel good about it the best you can. And you feel a hell of a lot better than if you just reacted to with the situation and you just went to the extreme i'm not talking about violence necessarily but it's like you went to the extreme you quit the job you 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 walked out of a relationship you you dropped the friendship well, at the first sign of, of of a conflict you've you've brought that up in the past where you had issues at your old career where you talk to your dad and you're like i'm, I'm yeah i'm not yeah. gonna do it anymore like I'm, I'm done i'm gonna quit and your dad literally said thing okay fine if you want to quit quit what are you going to do on Monday? Are you going to pay your bills? Dude. And you're like, ah, shit. Like, I don't have a, I, I think that's part of the problem is a lot of people sit there and they have this initial reaction, but they don't think about the long-term effects of that action. And if they actually sit there and take the time and be like, okay, this is what I want to do. Okay. Well, what's going to happen? Well, here's all these bad things that are going to happen if you make that choice shit i don't want any of that to happen so now what do i do what i what do i do that fixes the problem but also doesn't have a long-term consequence to it mm -hmm. and i think there's a lot of people that miss that step entirely i agree um and i and i think a lot of that has to come down to ego um and it has, i mean people just don't I think people are too quick to go to the extremes instead of how to handle the situation best. Um, are there alternatives to, are there alternative solutions to this that aren't an extreme that don't put me in an extreme situation or don't provide, you know, life altering effects? And, and I think a lot of that is you, you have to have that conversation with yourself. Yeah. You, you actually have to think about 
a solution. Instead of just reacting to a problem, you have to think about an actual solution to the problem mm. because there are a lot of short-term solutions that have long-term consequences. Absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot of people that they don't realize that until it's too late. And they sit there and go, I, you know, I wish I would have done this differently. You had a chance. You could have. All the avenues were there to be able to do something differently, but you you reacted in a hot head manner and you chose to do this. Like there were other options. And I, I mean I th- I think there's part partially a culture issue there as well. Where part of the culture says you should do one thing, but there's a lot of options that they don't talk about. Because no one gives a shit about that. Like, if you have an issue with a bully and you you deal with that or, um, you know, one-on-one, the two of you figure that out and you, you know, let's say it comes to, you know, fists. You, you guys get in a fight in the parking lot or in the playground at school and you figure it out then. Cool. Now it's done. It's just the two of you. The two of you are the only ones that deal with that. But I think there's... T- there's too many people out there that, um, <laughs> life blown up. Yep. Um, but no, I think there's too many people out there that they don't have a level head on themselves and they just take things too far and they don't realize, okay, you went there. Now you have to deal with it. And they're like, no, I don't want to, I don't want that to be the consequence. Well, no, you chose that. You chose that path. Now you have to deal with it. Yeah, I see some comments here as we're rolling out of this this uh, episode tonight. Is you know about the the reality as other people live in does not be the reality that you live in. Uh, it does um, to a point. Uh, I think it all goes about because you're saying that stuff. There are plenty of of kids and people that like that's just the lifestyle, right? Is to mm-hmm. do exactly that. So um, big issue. Um, appreciate the conversation tonight. Uh, best thing I can say is is that. Yeah, you have to realize everyone else might be having a bad day in everyday life is that you don't have to take it to the extremes all the time and um, try not to let little stuff bother you. You know what I mean? Um, That's the careless stuff is that, you know, we talk about like road rage. We talk about like, you know, things that like they ruin your whole fucking day or week because they said something that they were unhappy with about you or something that involves you or whatever. And, um, the best thing you can do is is to to roll with it and just allow yourself to process it to a point that you don't let yourself get wrecked by it mm-hmm. because you have the one life to live and i think that, that it should be a good one yeah that's what i'm trying to do cheers guys continue the conversation on the bourbon and bs community page if you'd like on the episode comments and all that stuff uh thank you very much nate for the bottle of the pure kentucky thank you guys for tuning in these cigars were great, both the um, the Oliva V Maduro and then obviously the Monte Cristo 1935 anniversary is just just fantastic smoke. Wait, great way for us to round it out. If you guys not have not had those cigars, they are available at uh, Tinderbox at Easton in Columbus, Ohio. Or if you can't get close to that, we can ship some to you or uh, check out your local brick and mortar for them. Guys, enjoy the week. We'll see you guys next Wednesday. We've got a trip from uh, Barrel Craft Spirit. It's going to be on remotely. We have um, a Barrel Bourbon Foundation, a newer one from them. It's an everyday bourbon from them. We should do a cigar from Foundation with that. If we get our shipment in, we will. Oh. Cheers, guys. (laughs) See you next week.